Oh my god. Oh, my lips are going to be burning though. Okay. So now you want to set up the APIC. And we kind of did that before. Uh, we released the early stack, we initialized the locals, and then we set up the interrupts here. And we want to set up the APIC. We might need to set up the pick as well. Um, I typically set up the pick. But basically, we're going to program a timer to fire, let's say, every second or so. Um, and a pick is, where is it at? A pick. Okay. So I might actually do a decent amount of refreshing on this because I, I've never been an a pick wizard, but effectively the a pick is what translates the interrupts from hardware into the correct vectors. Um, so let's see, locally connected things. They also might be connected to an 8259, which is an old interrupt controller that is in turn connected to the processor through one of the local interrupt pins. So that is the common case. So let's see. Um... So we're going to set up an APIC uh, controller or an APIC thing. So we're done here. This is going to be a, a switch to a kernel-based uh, GDT. Load a TSS with um, a, a critical stack for uh, certain, for DF. MC and NMI interrupts, uh, kernel base, uh, set, then set up a IDT with all interrupts passing through to the uh, interrupt handler. Uh, interrupt handler, handler rust function. Okay, cool. So we talk about that. We describe all those quite well. And here, this is going to be the entry point for all interrupts and exceptions. Perfect. That's already described quite well. All right. So we'll say get status, get diff. Um, and this should now be succeeding, right? Yeah, let's get rid of this exception because we don't need it anymore. Okay. Get status, get diff. LGDT, that's been changed. Global ASM, we added that. Uh, interrupts are now being initialized. We added a guard page. Uh, get status, get add uh, kernel source, get status, get commit AM. Added guard pages around virtual allocations. Also added, um, also added uh, interrupt support. Get push. Okay, history C cargo run. So now that is up. Oh my god, this pineapple is so fucking good. All right, so let's get a um, let's get a timer interrupt going. So to do this, we need to set up an APIC. I'm gonna do this through kernel source apic.rs. We will do um, mod APIC, and we're actually yeah, we're banging out a lot of stuff that I wanted to do. We're going to add X2 APIC support here too. And we'll see if we can get this code base working on the Xeon Phi with uh, 256 cores uh, when we get this code working. So super excited for this. Okay. Um, 
pub mod apic uh pub unsafe fn and uh kernel source interrupts fn in it pub unsafe fn okay cool just want to make sure that was unsafe pub unsafe fn in it and this will um this will be apic shit and what we have to do is we have to detect if the X2 APIC is present. And if the X2 APIC is present, then we want to switch everything over to use the X2 APIC, which will use read and write MSRs instead of writing to memory. It's kind of weird. What exactly are you doing? Uh, we implemented a bootloader and now we're working on the kernel side of things for an operating system that's designed for CPU research and fuzzing, which is effectively a technique used to find security bugs, um, to find vulnerabilities in software, um, or hardware in this case, because I will use this to fuzz uh, Intel processors as well, and AMD processors, and honestly, probably ARM processors. I'll probably use the same kernel. Okay, so we're gonna enable the APIC. So we'll do APIC init. This will work, it'll do nothing, perfect. And now, what we need to detect is the X2 APIC. So, we're in the APIC section right now. And here we go. So we have X APIC mode. Basic operating mode of the X APIC is X APIC mode. The X2 APIC is an extension for that. The local APIC, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, determine its status. Yeah, so the local APIC is what we care about. And we're gonna program this on processors supporting the X2 APIC architecture indicated by that CPU ID bit. The local APIC supports both X APIC mode and if enabled by software, X2 APIC mode. X2 APIC mode provides extended processor addressability, which allows us to use, instead of an 8-bit value for a processor number, we use a 32-bit value. So it works on systems with greater than like 254 processors, which I require in my, um, I require that functionality in my Xeon Phi. Okay. What I notice is that you rarely write a lot of code before testing it uh, if it does what you expect. Where do you learn that habit? I don't know, actually. I would, I would say I'm pretty self-aware of that as one of my programmer like mentalities. I don't know how unique it is to me, but yeah, I typically. I typically write like three lines of code, build test, write three lines of code, build test. And I think a lot of that is I, I do test a lot of negative assumptions of the code. So I will write something and I'll be like, this should not work yet. This should not work yet. This should fail in this way. And when things don't work or do work, um, I normally like to understand how they fail. So you'll hear me a lot say, this is going to fail because this, I test it. And then if it doesn't fail in that way, but it still fails or it succeeds, I consider all of those failures because I want it to fail in the way I anticipate. Um, and I think it's really important for rapid development to never actually let the complexity of a bug exceed 50 lines of code, you know, where the, where the bug is so local to what you just recently touched that it's really not too hard to make a leap to what the bug is. I don't know, it's it's how I develop. I don't know if it's common in other developers, but it's basically the only way I can write code. How long have you been working on this? Uh, I don't know, probably like 30 to 50 hours in that ballpark. We've done like three or four different streams at this point, so. I think that's pretty much all we've done uh, so far. Okay. Um, so 
So we want to initialize the APIC. To initialize the APIC, we want to first check if there's an APIC present. Um, for a correct APIC operation, this address space must be mapped to a, uh, an area of memory that has been designated as strong uncacheable. Um, yeah, we actually want to do that. We actually want to remap the APIC uh, as uncacheable. So the APIC's going to be on the core. And we're going to implement a struct on that. Uh, struct APIC. This is the APIC. Um, and let's close some of these windows because we're not using a lot of them anymore. Technically, if we panic inside of a, a print, uh, we'll deadlock, but that's not, that's not a huge issue yet. That's something we can add. Uh, let's actually make a GitHub issue for that right now. So we don't forget, um, shatter locks on interrupts, uh, on fatal exceptions. If a fatal interrupt or exception occurs, we should uh, init all other processors and then shatter locks. This allows us to print things. I oh, shouldn't shatter locks. We should um, handle locks on fatal exceptions. Um, if a fatal interrupt or exception occurs, we should uh, have a mechanism to stop all other running processors and then take full control of the hardware that, um, take full control of hardware such that we can handle printing to serial if we happen to panic while the print lock was held. Okay, now I won't forget. Perfect. Because that is something that I don't know, that'll probably cost me uh, 10 to 15 minutes to fix that bug when it comes up. Uh, so. Okay, APIC. We're going to detect the APIC and we'll do uh, enum APIC mode. Yeah, let's do, yeah, we'll say APIC mode. We'll say x2 apic and apic. Uh, it's actually not a great way to style as that. Rust is going to be pretty unhappy. Um, so we'll say x2 apic here. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, and this will... Um, uh, the different modes of the apic. And I think what I might actually do is I might make it so these enums are where they're implemented. Um, I think I'm going to do that. I think that's what I'm going to do, this. And what we're going to do is we're going to core apic um, kernel source core locals. We're going to add something to the core local structure. And this is kind of where we store everything that we need. So we're going to go into here and we're going to say pub apic is an apic. Uh, a reference, oh, oop. this is going to be lock cell apic. Yeah, uh, and this will be lock cell apic, option apic. It'll be null or none when not initialized. And this will be uh, an initialized uh, apic implementation. Um, and that'll be none, uh, will be none until the APIC has been initialized for this core. So now what I can do is we can get access to the APIC. Let APIC is equal to APIC uh, core dot APIC dot lock. And we can assert APIC is none. Uh, APIC was already initialized. 
In fact, this doesn't have to be unsafe if we do this. Um, same for interrupts. Let's do that. Uh, interrupts. Oops. Interrupts and knit. Let's make both of these safe. Um, because they'll only ever initialize once. Initialize interrupts. Uh, this will initialize the apic, and then these will have locks. And this will be uh, pub interrupts uh, enabled, and this will be a lock cell bool. This will um, uh, interrupts initialized, and this will track uh, tracks if interrupts have been initialized. If they have not, we should not allow the enablement of interrupts. Okay, so it's safe that we don't in it interrupts because we will check that interrupts are initialized any place that we create an interrupt handler. So in a driver, if we register interrupts, uh, we'll probably architect this in a way that will require that you get access to this. But for now, um, this will prevent us from double initting interrupts and it will also prevent us from ever being able to create or register an interrupt handler. Uh, yeah. I think that's what we want. I think we want this to prevent us from registering an interrupt handler. Unless we have access to the interrupt structure. Let's do that. Fuck y'all. Yeah. Aren't you already tracking that with the option? In this case, interrupts are going to be slightly different. Um, check this out. Here's what I'm going to do. The apex is going to be different than the interrupts. They're very similar. Um, they're very related, but they're not. There's not a hundred percent overlap, so I don't think it's worth combining them. This is going to be um, the uh, interrupt uh, interrupt implementation. This is used to. Um, add interrupt handlers uh, to the interrupt table. Oops. Um, if this is none, then interrupts have not yet been initialized. Okay, and then we can split kernel source uh, interrupts. This will make a struct interrupts. Um, struct interrupts. Uh, structure to hold different dispatch routines for interrupts. And in this case, we will have dispatch um, for interrupts. Yeah, and this will take a function. Uh, take a U64. Oops, uh, function for 256. These are options. Okay, um, and then at the end of fn init, this will be safe now. And what we can do is we can create this interrupt structure. So let uh, interrupts is equal to core interrupts lock. Uh, assert interrupts is none. Uh, interrupts have already been initialized. So if interrupts have been initialized, then we're going to panic hard. Now at the end of this function, we can do interrupts is equal to interrupts. We'll make a new structure and we'll wrap it in a sum. And this way we can actually do a lot of, we can get rid of a lot of unsafe in our kernel by forcing uh, these things to be correct, where you cannot access or do an unsafe thing unless the thing is initialized. So I really like this model, actually, for this kernel. Do you also stream stuff uh, for the level of university students? I'm interested in, 
I'm interested in knowing low-level stuff, but what you're doing right now is too hardcore for me. So I would say university st student should eventually be able to understand something like this uh, through like an OS dev course. Sometimes that's going to be like a 400, 500, or a 600 uh, program, and some universities won't offer low-level dev like this at all. I typically only do low-level development here. Uh, I don't really do any high-level development at all, but you can always ask questions, and I will gladly go on tangents, make test programs, and rip things out into isolation uh, to kind of show you uh, why I architect and write things in certain ways, because I do think that is important uh, to be able to understand that. So we're going to pull in uh, create interrupts interrupts use create um apic apic okay oh i'll do that okay uh interrupts is a private struct that makes sense pub struct so if we initialize twice it would panic quite hard here, which is great. That's exactly what I want. And then this will be a pub enum of an apic 91 core locals on core locals on happy here. That makes sense because here we'll have a apic is a locks only none and interrupts is also a locks only none. Okay, uh, missing dispatch on the creation of interrupts. That makes sense because that is here. Um, interrupts. And what we're going to do is by default, dispatch is a none for 256. Beautiful. This is creates uh, the interrupts. Interrupts. Yeah, create the interrupts um, structure. Uh, and then here we'll say this is on safe. Um, and this is on safe. And interrupts, let mute on this. Beautiful, check stack. Okay, so that means we've exceeded a stack frame somewhere and um, Codebase really wants to be able to check that. So we'll go into kernel source. Um, e shared corex, uh, sp shared corex source. So we'll implement uh, global check stack, check stack, ret, it'll do nothing. So check stack typically is used to uh, dynamically allocate pages on the stack. So the stack has a limited size, but eventually you might have recursion or something. And check stack is used uh, on Microsoft implementations to check whether or not the stack is present for a certain amount. And if it is, or if it isn't, it will request a larger stack from the kernel. In our case, we have a fixed stack size, so we'll just let it crash if it goes out of bounds. I'm taking an Intel uh, x86 32-bit assembly course right now, and should be taking an ORS course in a year from now. I think I can't yet understand uh, this even to ask questions. Um, yeah, well, let me know if you do have any questions, but I do recognize that we are going relatively quickly through a lot of this stuff. Um, these are the dispatch, dispatch routine, uh, dispatch routines, and we're going to do a type, uh, interrupt dispatch, um, for interrupts. Okay. Dispatch is equal to a function that takes a size, uh, that is the interrupt number. Then we have the frame. We have a mutable reference, uh, actually. Yep, frame and then error. 
and then immutable reference to uh, all regs. Uh, dispatch routines, uh, dispatch routine definition. Okay, um, and we're gonna say arguments are interrupt number, frame, error code, and all registers. Uh, uh, register state at int. Okay. So this will take an interrupt dispatch. Beautiful. All right, now what we can do is impl interrupts fn add handler mute self. Uh, this will return a this will return I think I don't want to have dynamic stuff here, so this will return a bool. Um, uh, register and interrupt handler for handler for interrupt num. This will take a number. Technically, it can be a u8 in this case. We'll say a u8 here too. Um, the previous value, yeah. I'm 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 thinking about that, but I might. I don't know what anyone would do with that, but they would be able to see if they replaced one. Um, I think I'm actually going to have this panic. And then I'll have like a check handler if there is already one in place. Um, and then handler interrupt dispatch, dispatch. And then here we'll do self.dispatch dot uh, num is equal to some handler asserts self dot dispatch num as u size as u size uh, is none um, interrupt handler already installed for num uh, in number this. Okay, and then just got up that beautiful handler. Okay, sweet. So that allows us to create it, and now what we can do is in interrupt handler. Uh, if let's, uh, well, I guess we can't possibly get here if that's not, if that doesn't exist, so we can just do this. It, it's impossible to get here without initializing interrupts. So we'll say let interrupts is equal to interrupts.asmute.unwrap. Don't even need a message, it'll never fail. And then here what we can do is, uh, ooh, and this will return bool um, returns true if the interrupt was handled and it should be re-executed uh, and uh, execution should continue. Okay. Sweet. So here we'll go through uh, if let sum handler equals um say you here as well. We'll go into um interrupts dot handlers, is that what we called it? Dispatch. Eh. Number as you size. If there's a handler, then handler with number frame error regs, if this succeeds, return, otherwise fall through. Okay, so we should be able to make a custom interrupt handler now, and that'll be local to our specific core. Maybe make dispatch a method on interrupt handlers, 
Um, I mean, I could, but I don't know. I'm fine with this because this is literally the only spot that this will ever be used. <clears throat> I feel like it's unnecessary to make... Uh, like, it, it, it'll never be used anywhere else. I, I don't know if you agree with that. If you don't agree with it, I would be uh, curious to hear your reasons for that. Um, I'm always looking to adapt my coding styles to things that are more intuitive. So this will be invoke the uh, interrupt handler, the dynamically installed, uh, if it exists. Um, handler said this interrupt was handled return out and then returning from this will cause us to try execution again okay so what we should be able to do now is um we should be able to do a uh, core pointer right volatile unsafe um i guess adding a handler is unsafe Um, let's actually see. This should be an unsafe function. There we go. So here we're going to write volatile uh, to OX leet leet as mute u64. We're going to write a zero. That's going to cause a crash. Currently, this is going to cause an exception. It does. Fantastic. So then what we're going to do is we're going to do um core interrupts uh lock as mute unwrap i think we can do this all in one line um and whatever we called this add handler uh number we're gonna add a handler for page faults and it'll go to handler and it'll panic if it fails, which I like. Uh, pub fn. It's safe to add the handler because the handler that you implement is marked unsafe. Now we can unsafe fn handler. Uh, and then this will take the number, the um, mute uh, frame, mute interrupt frame, uh, error u size, and regs mute all regs and i'll do nothing uh print hit exception uh we'll return false for not handled bool okay all regs uh use create interrupts we're just doing this because i'm lazy right now because this is a test code right so let's see if we hit that handler and then there we go hit exception and then bam that failed. Now let's see if we did true. This should just infinitely loop because it'll keep trying it. Beautiful. Fuck yeah. Because it'll try and go and we didn't handle the exception. Wonderful. Okay, so that allows us to dynamically add. It allows us to safely add interrupt handlers. Um, obviously the interrupt handler itself is unsafe, but adding the handler is safe. Um... And now initializing everything is actually uh, safe. We have no unsafe yet, which is beautiful because it means we have abstracted all of the unsafe away uh, from a lot of this code, which is which is great. I really don't want unsafe here. I don't like having the unsafe. Uh, I like the fact that we can reorder these things and they will fail if they don't work in that order. We're going to prevent most operating systems. Typically, we'll initialize things in a specific order. And if you change the order, it will just do undefined memory corruption, incorrect things, because things aren't set up. And we are intentionally designing everything here that if something is not done in a specific order, then you don't have access to the resource that would be uninitialized, and you would crash if you try to access it, because it would be in an option, which is none, or something like that. Um, 
So we're trying to make this kernel really bulletproof, and quite frankly, I'm pretty impressed with uh, how this code is turning out so far. Okay, add handler. Uh, we're just gonna say um, allow dead code. Because, yeah, we don't have anything using that, and we're just gonna say, hey, uh, this should exist. Um, anyways. Fuck yeah. Okay, so now we do the a pick, and what we're gonna do is the a pick if if it's not initialized. So uh, get access to and make sure the existing a pick uh, make sure the a pick has not yet been initialized. And then in this case, we can now uh, CPU features is equal to CPU uh, uh, get features. I think. Uh, get CPU features, perfect. And we can say um, SP shared CPU source, get CPU features, and we should have a pick here, yeah. So what we'll do is uh, assert CPU features a pick. Uh, a pick is not available available on this system. Uh, okay, APIC is not available on the system. And this is, uh, we require, we require that the APIC is supported on this system. If the, the APIC is supported on literally every system that has multiple cores. So basically anything back to like 2004. Um, so I'll make sure that APIC is supported. Perfect, and this should also have an X2 A pick. Maybe. Let's uh, let's see what the manual says for that. So the A pick. Um. X2 A pick is indicated by ECX twenty one. On CPU ID 1, 21. That's this. This is uh, X2 A pick. So we'll double check that in a second. But it should be in the same structure as the A pick, apparently. And what we can do, and that's, yeah, that was CPU ID 1, and we can say, um, and uh, CPU ID wiki, and we'll get the Wikipedia page, which will tell us this, and we'll just search for uh, X2 APIC. And yeah, let's see. APIC is at, oh, that's an EDX. Oh yeah, yeah, this is at, uh, this is actually in this. Okay, X2 APIC is here. Okay, so X2 APIC is at 2, shift 21, which is EAX, EBX, EAX, EBX, ECX, yep, which is 2, and then this should be right next to uh, SSE 4.2. So SSE 4.2 is right before it, and then the X2 APIC, perfect. So that's exactly where we want that to be, and X2 APIC, there's no field in the structure. We'll just put it here, pub x2 apic bool. By default, nothing is supported. Okay, so if the x2 apic is supported, then that's all we're going to use. Um, and we're gonna see what we can do here. Uh, uh, get the CPU features for this system. And then here we'll say uh, print uh, X2 APIC supported, question mark, this, uh, CPU features dot X2 APIC. Hey, it is supported. Sweet. So that means we can do some development testing here. Just curious, I assume streaming is not your job. Nope, not at all. <clears throat> I just do this for fun. I don't even really bend uh, bend my streams to be more entertaining. I just kind of I kind of just do what I would otherwise be doing. 
to be to be honest. Um, not really trying to be entertaining or anything crazy. We're just writing code and having fun. So assert that the APIC is supported. Okay, then at the next stage, we want to initialize the APIC. And we do that, well, let's see, X2 APIC. It extends that, has all of these same things, but uh, better scalability, better performance. So detecting that, we check that bit. That can place the local APIC in X2 APIC mode by setting the X2 APIC mode enable bit, bit 10. Uh-huh. In the IA32 APIC base MSR at 1B. Okay. So we're going to do uh, const... IA32 APIC base is a U32, which is OX1B, um, MSR for the IA32 uh, APIC base. And then what we're going to do is for both modes, we're going to initialize it. Um, okay. X APIC global enable. Okay, local APIC is disabled, invalid mode. Local APIC is enabled and an X APIC mode, and this is local APIC enabled and is an X2 APIC mode. So we basically are just going to set up these bits. So we'll um, let previous states is equal to um, uh, Yeah, what are we going to do? We're going to grab a CPU read MSR i32 apic base. Uh, load the previous, um, this is unsafe. I think it should be unsafe. Uh, i32 apic base. Fantastic. Okay, so we're going to read that MSR. And then what we need to figure out, the apic base is from 12 to 35. Okay. So, um, so what we wanna do is uh, mask off the old base address for the APIC. And let's do previous state is equal to previous state and the inverse of uh, OXFFFFFOOO. That is, 31, that's 31 to 12, 32, 33, 34, 35. So that's going to be another F. Mask off the old base address for the APIC. Um, we're just going to do that. And that should be bits 12 through 35. So this is 32, 33, 34, 35. Okay, perfect. So that will mask that off. And then what you want to do, the BSP, we don't want to affect that flag. And we want to or in, um, let previous state is equal to previous state or, oh, it's F -E -E -O, o o o And this is going to be or in the APIC base that we want to use. So this is establishing um, const apic base. This is establishing the location in memory, phys in physical memory, that we want the apic to exist at. So this is the uh, physical address we want the local apic to be mapped at. And that's the default. So we're just making sure the BIOS didn't remap it, because the BIOS can remap it. And then at that point, we control all of these bits the BSP we're leaving, and then we're going to set these bits uh, depending on the mode. So we're going to say if uh, let previous state is equal to previous state or one shift um, 11. And this is uh, enable the APIC, uh, X APIC which is this, so we set bit 11. And then the next thing, if x2 apic is present, uh, is um, 
supported, then we want to use the X2 APIC. And I'm just going to say if CPU features dot X2 APIC, then previous states or one shift 12. Um, honestly, we'll do this. Um, let previous state is equal to previous state or uh, CPU features dot apic x2 apic as u64 shift by 10. We want to use the x2 apic, right? Bit 10, perfect. And now uh, enable the apic. Uh, reprogram the apic with the uh, new settings. Okay, CPU, write MSR, I3, I32 apic base, and this is, um, oh, this would be previous state? I don't know. Um, we'll say, oops, instead of previous state, um, Apic base. Uh, Apic val. Apic base val. Mm, that doesn't fit cleanly. Um, Apic. We'll say Apic base. Mask off the old address. Or in the Apic base that we want to use. Enable the X Apic uh, unconditionally. If X2 APIC is supported, then we want to use the X2 APIC, and then we reprogram it with the new settings, APIC base. Done. So this will program the X2 APIC. Oh, fatal exception. Well, good thing we have an interrupt handler. Yeah, check this shit out. So this will tell me we had a failure at 5EF7, and it was at a right MSR. Okay, this is saying that we had a D, which is a, a general protection fault. Um, so something was unhappy about what we programmed in this APIC. Let's, uh, let's first see if this is it. Let's see. Ah. And what is going on here? Oh, is this happening on the second stage? FE 900. Is this in main? This is an entry. Yeah, this is what we're setting up. So we read the MSR. We and EAX with 100. What? 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 Read that. And with not that. Test with a hundred. Oh, this is, oh, the APIC isn't it. This is in the, um, this stage. Okay, I was wondering if this was the case. It's because we uh, reinitialized the APIC here, which we don't want to do. So, but this does work. Look at that. We actually have the ability to kind of debug in this state, which is pretty fucking awesome. Okay, so we don't want to bring up other cores yet. So this is um, enable and normalize the APIC base. Perfect. Now what we want to do is... If we're using X2 APIC, we actually access the APIC through MSRs. Um, yeah, use the MSR address range 800 to 8FF. And that is equivalent, if I'm not mistaken, to the APIC base. Yeah, I think it's equivalent to... Um,
DR support at offset E0. In this case, oh, there are some exceptions. OK. So basically, when you're in X2 APIC mode, you use MSRs instead of offsets. And here you can see the mapping. So if we wanted to write to the, um, what's a good example? Um, I, uh, the ICR. This is how we initialize. Uh, this is how we send an interprocessor interrupt. You'll see that the bits used. Uh, so we use this MSR in X2 APIC mode, but in normal APIC mode, we take this address, this APIC base, and then we add 300 hex to it, and we write to that memory. So the X2 APIC uses MSRs, which speeds things up quite a bit, as the processor doesn't have to hijack things off that address bus. There's a one-to-one -one mapping between X2 APIC MSRs and the legacy X APIC register offsets with the following exceptions. DFR supported at offset in E0 in X APIC mode is not supported in X2 APIC mode. There is no MSR. That's fine. The ICR, the two 32-bit registers in the X APIC mode at offsets 300, 310 are merged into a single 64-bit MSR in X2 APIC mode with MSR address 830. Oh, uh -huh. there is no MSR address with 831. The self IPI register. This register is available only in X2 APIC mode at uh, 83F. Okay, so that means we don't want to expose arbitrary access to uh, these APIC things. We want to actually make sure that they correctly um, are limited based on our software to not violate these constraints. So I don't want to have an API that's just like write APIC and you give it an offset and it will determine uh, which one to use. So, okay. So one thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to open this manual again and we're going to go to the uh, page table thing and we need to find the way to disable caching um, because the APIC should be accessed as strong uncacheable. Um, and to do that, we're going to mark it uncacheable through the page tables. So we'll do that in paging. Um, and we'll just take a look at four level paging. And we just care about the bit that is, I think it's the PCD bit, the page cache disable. So this will disable, um, that is for a table. That maps on one gig page. Indirectly determines the memory type used to access this page referenced by this entry. See section 492. So this will make the caching um, fully disabled for both reads and writes. So what we want to do in APIC mode, we're going to make, we're going to have a virtual address. Uh, in this case, it'll be a mutable reference to U32s. Um, actually, this will just be a slice of U32s. Um, and what we're going to do is if we create an APIC, if we're not in X2 APIC mode, then this will be a slice to uncacheable memory that has been virtually allocated into the current address space to map this APIC base region. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the APIC is just one page. So let's take a look at the, um, I'm so excited for this stuff. We're getting really close here to having some pretty cool functionality. Um, local APIC, let's see if I can find that table. Here it is. So it does fit, it actually fits in 400 hex. So that's what we'll do. Um, registers are 32 bits, 64, 256. All are aligned on 128 bit boundaries. Is that true? Yeah, they are. Uh huh. Um, all 32 bit registers should be accessed using 128 bit aligned 32 bit loads and stores. I 
I think all of them are 32 bits. I wasn't aware of any of these that use larger than that, but uh, okay. Inter in interesting. Um, so we're gonna make those. Yeah, we'll do U32s. Wider registers must be accessed. Oh yeah, wider registers, 64 or 256 bit, must be accessed using multiple 32 bit loads in stores with all access being 128 bit aligned. So we only care we only care about um, U32s, which is fantastic. And this is going to be a... Uh, we might actually just do vert adder on this. Because otherwise we're going to have issues. I mean, you know what? Lifetimes we don't actually have issues with. This can be static mute. We never free it. We never free it. Okay. So then... What we're going to do is if, if we're not CPU features uh, x2 apic, um, if we're in normal x2 apic, mo uh, x apic mode, we want to virtually map in the uh, apic physical memory as uncacheable. Um, and update the apic uh, enum state. Okay. Dave, hell yeah, six months. Holy shit. That is insane. I can't believe it. I can't believe it's actually been six months since... It's been six months since I've been a Twitch um, affiliate, which is pretty nuts because I remember when I first set that up and I was like, this is definitely a little, uh, probably going to be gimmicky, and I don't think I'll get a decent run going on Twitch. And I would say the fact that I can have 130 viewers when doing development is pretty fucking insane. So thanks, everyone, for all of the subs, all of the follows, all of the watches on YouTube, all of the Twitter follows. Uh, it's, it's weird, man. It's really weird. I never would have expected this. I, I really never would. <laughs> I'm just a fucking low-level developer <laughs> who loves doing random low-level dev, and I don't really have much... I don't pay much attention to glamorous coding. What we're doing here is all terminal. Like, there's nothing here that's, like, popping. Uh, there's no UI. There's no feedback. There's no excitement. But I have excitement in what I do, and I, I, I'm really excited that other people seem to share that. You're on YouTube as well? Yeah. So I don't actually uh, make videos. I upload all my VODs to YouTube. Um, I'll probably eventually hire someone to edit some of my videos down. The difficulty in having someone edit my videos down, first of all, they're massive. The, these streams are like 14 plus hours each. Second of all, it would be very difficult to have someone who would know what should be highlighted. They could highlight things and like clip things based on my excitement and condense down a 14-hour stream into 20 minutes based on when I'm excited. Um, but I think it might be difficult for a non-programmer, you know, like an editor, to actually understand what things are relevant to include in a, in a video. Maybe specific tangents, yeah. Give us the raw, low-level footage. Yeah, that's what I upload right now. That's what I up to upload to YouTube now. But honestly, I could maybe have someone hire just the exciting and ranty parts of these things. And I think that would actually do okay on its own. So... <laughs> you got excited when the infinite loop happened? <laughs> I'm easily excited by my code. Okay, if we're in normal x apic mode, we want to virtually map in this memory. So uh, get access to the current page table. Page uh, let mute page table is equal to core uh, boot args page table uh, lock. Let page table is page table dot as mute unwrap. So we're getting access to the page table. Um, and then 
outside of here we can uh, get access to physical uh, memory allocations, and we'll do let me pmem is equal to mm physical memory. And then what we should be able to do here is page table dot. Uh, oh, um, I need a virtual address. I think, yeah, I think what I'll do is I'm going to make a slight change, but we're actually really close to what I want here. Uh, so this should build. It's not going to do anything. Uh, mm, uh, we'll do create mm. And I really wish Vim didn't have create highlighted like that. Uh, I think that's a relatively new Rust thing, and this version of Vim doesn't have that. I think if I downloaded the latest uh, uh, Rust syntax for Vim, I'd be able to fix that. Because um, that probably is no longer a thing. Let's see. Maybe you can have a session where you talk about something, uh, and this could go on YouTube. Absolutely. Yeah, so sometimes I stream games, but very, very rarely, to be honest. Uh, but I'm always open to question when I'm playing games or doing something casually for any questions about security or ideas or hacking or exploitation, OS development. Um, I'm open to all of these things. So, okay. For this to work, I actually need to request, right now, I have no way of uh, getting a virtual address. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have I'm going to have a function here pubfn and this is going to be um, allocate alloc vert address and this is going to take in a size and it's going to return a uh, vert adder and this is going to um, uh, res um, find a free region of virtual memory uh, that can hold size bytes and return the virtual address. Okay, so what we'll do here is we'll do um, uh, virtual address is equal to next free virtual address fetch add size bytes and then let's uh, uh, we're gonna say 4k um, this is only valid for uh, virtual requests for four kilobyte mappings okay because if it's not 4k then we're gonna have issues let size is equal to and honestly we might just uh, assume that we're gonna assert uh, size is greater than zero and size and OXFFF is zero. Uh, invalid size for virtual uh, allocation. And this is going to be virtual range, uh, region. I'll say that. So it's a unique string. So if the size, assert the size is greater than zero and it's 4K aligned. This is only valid for that. And then we'll do a fetch add size. Um, plus guard page size. We'll do it as uh, U64 here. And here we can do a, um, we'll do guard page size checked add uh, size as U64. Um, expect integer overflow on uh, virtual region size. Okay, fetch add this, ordering sequentially consistent, and that's it. This is the virtual address. Uh, vert adder this. There we go. So that'll get us a new unique virtual address. Um, and the problem is this uh, next free virtual address will actually wrap a boundary. So let's actually add a check for that. So we'll say... Um, yeah, let ret is equal to this. Assert ret dot zero is greater than or equal to kernel vmem base. If it's not, then we know that this overflowed. And we can say, um, 
Yeah, let's see here. There's really no great way of checking this, to be honest. Um, well, we're never going to virtually allocate the whole space. Yeah, this is fine. It would panic in a different path. Uh, I don't know. I kind of want to... I can actually do this. Assert. Uh, we, we can do this. Um, next, the size that we got, the allocation that we just got, checked sub... Um, here, this will be, um, reserve size is equal to this, which will be this, oops, V to here, delete that, paste, um, compute the amount of virtual memory to reserve, including the, uh, guard size. Okay, now we'll get, we'll fetch add, a virtual, uh, we'll fetch add the reserve size. Oh, God, we just barely don't fit. That's fine. So this is um, attempt to get a new virtual mapping, or this is just get a new virtual region that is free. Here we're going to check sub reserve size expect integer overflow on virtual address range um, if we cannot subtract the reserve size from the uh, return value then the virtual memory wrapped the 64-bit uh, boundary and then we can just return ret. Does that make sense? So it starts off valid. We're going to add something to it. That thing that we add to it has been validated to not overflow. So if we add this and we are no, we're not able to check sub what we just added to this structure, then we actually overflowed. And in which case, we reserved too much memory. We, we ran out of virtual address space. So what we can do is guard page size here let virtual address is equal to this for a line size uh, get a unique virtual address for this allocation and now i'm actually going to move these into here to further scope them so that no one has access to these variables because this is the only place in the kernel that needs access to this um, and I guess this can take a U64, 268, it's already a virtual address. Okay, uh, 273, uh, vert address dot zero as mute U8. Done! Okay, so now using the same pool of virtual uh, regions. So this is just linearly allocating out of virtual regions. Eventually, we'll run out of virtual address space, and this will panic. And we'll eventually need to add support for res uh, going back and retrying and all these things. But right now, uh, we'll just let you run out of virtual memory, and it'll panic. So this will fail closed, at least right now. OK. So what this allows me to do on the APIC side of things is I can call this function here, and I, I can say, I need something. Um, let vatter get a virtual address capable of holding a four kilobyte mapping. So now we have a virtual address. That means now we can go to virtual memory. Um, Uh, and we can map a single raw page there. So we can do, uh, let's go into shared page table source map raw. And what we'll do here is we'll do page table map raw 
and we'll get a virtual address before we grab the lock. We want to keep that lock for as small amount of time as possible. So, uh, we're going to map raw using mute pmem, physical memory here. We're going to use the virtual address we just created. We're going to use a page type, a uh, page 4K. And the raw bits that we're going to use for this mapping will be the APIC base or page write or page present. Um, and here we'll do use page table, uh, page type, page write, page present, uh, page NX. We're never going to execute this, so it doesn't need to be executable. So I'll say page NX. So a non-executable page that is present. Uh, and this can fail. So we'll do um, expect failed to map in. Uh, this is failed to map in. Um, Build to map in APIC to virtual memory. Okay, so this, uh, yeah, we'll do that as well. Use create mm uh, alloc vert adder 4k. Okay, um, I might actually just say mm on that. Yeah, we'll pull the, we'll pull it in. Ah, fuck. Use create mm alloc Vert adder 4k. Uh, map raw. Yep, this is unsafe. Oh, that just barely fits, but this isn't correct yet. This will this will perform the mapping now. Well, actually, X2 APIC mode is supported. So we're just gonna say um, we're gonna make this mute temporarily, and we're gonna say CPU features dot X2 APIC is false. We're going to force it to go down that path. OK, so that succeeded. So now what we need to do is we need to add the PCD bit, the page cache disable. Um, PubCons page PCD. Uh, I think we'll do this is equal to 1 shift 4. Just make it a little bit more clear. Okay, and that was at bit four, correct? And that's for a one gig page, for a two meg page, and for a 4K page as well. So they're all the same, and that's at bit four, correct? Okay, so now uh, use page table page cache disable, and I'll set that bit here, or page cache disable. Okay, so it's non-executable, it's writable, caching is disabled entirely for this page, and the page is marked as present. So it's read-writable, non-executable, uh, and the cache is disabled, and it's based at this physical address, the APIC base, which is great. Um, and then up here, we're gonna assert um, APIC base and OXFFF is zero, and we're gonna say invalid APIC base address. Um, and we're gonna assert uh, that the APIC base is greater than zero and this. We're never going to move this, but this is just going to be uh, make sure the APIC base is valid. Um, actually, we also need to make sure that it doesn't exceed this boundary. Oh, uh, make sure that the APIC base is equal to the APIC base and this. So if masking that off is not equal, then one of these bits is set or one of these bits is set, and it's not a valid APIC base. OK. Perfect. I'll put a comma there. So assert the APIC base is greater than 0. Technically, I don't think that matters, but we'll just assert that anyways. Um, and that looks like an expensive compile or runtime assert, but the compiler actually will uh, 
it's a constant. So the compiler will just never omit this code. So then down here, we map that in. Um, otherwise, yeah. So this is if XTAPIC is not supported. Otherwise, if the uh, X2APIC is supported, if the X2APIC is supported, then we don't actually have to make this mapping. Oh, we're also going to do uh, let mapping is equal to this. Uh, and here we'll do core pointer, our core slice from raw parts mutable. Um, and we'll return the... Let's see. Epic base. Um, from raw parts mute. Epic base. Uh, one second. I'm going to manage my Tibby character quick. Boop. Okay, boop, boop, doop. Okay, and this, perfect. Okay, so um, if there is no APIC, then we're going to uh, APIC base as meet U32 uh, for 1024. 1024 times four, is 4096. So this is uh, convert the APIC virtual memory into a uh, Rust slice. And now we have that slice. Now we can do this. APIC is equal to sum APIC, APIC mapping. Done. Uh, this needs to be mutable. So that's going to initialize it with that. So now we've access to the APIC through there. So this is going to um, uh, allocate, or this is going to be map virtual address to the APIC base as non-executable, writable, readable, and uh, cache disabled. Beautiful. So then if the X2 APIC is supported, then we can just say that the APIC is equal to sum APIC X2 APIC. Uh, I don't think we actually have to set anything up in the X2 APIC because we have enabled the X2 APIC if it's supported. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll impl on APIC and then APIC will be able to handle um, the different types of like interrupts. So here we'll say, here we'll say unsafe fn. Um, this is not going to be public. This is going to be um, write. Eh. Pub unsafe fn, and this will be. We care about 300 right now, which is the ICR. Write ICR. We'll take a mutable reference to this ourself, the APIC. We'll make sure we have mutable access to our, our APIC. And then we will take the uh, value to write to the ICR. And this will write a value to the APIC's um, ICR. And we might make an ICR command creator here, but uh, for now, we'll just match self apic mapping. Um, and in this case, uh, core mem write volatile. Um, and then we can do mapping OX300 over four because that's the index, um, 300 over 4 as mute pointer, 
and we'll write the value. Otherwise, on an x2a pick, uh, oh, and that's going to write a, um, we latch in the, what is this? I think you write the top bits first. The ICR. It's a 64-bit register. Um, the act of writing the low double word causes the IPI to be sent. So we first fill in the high part. This is the val shift 32 as a U32. This will be the val shift by zero as a U32. This will be written to uh, 310. Uh, write the high part. And then this will uh, write the low part causing the um, interrupt to be sent. Otherwise, in the X2 APIC mode, we'll do a CPU, write MSR, and we will write that to, let's take a look. For the 300, we do 830. So we write to 830, and we write the value. Done. So this will correctly, based on the mode, uh, a pick, a pick, and a pick, x2 a pick. This will correctly use the a pick or the x2 a pick, depending on how we configured it. Um, as meet pointer, not found any u32. Ooh. <clears throat> Oh, right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Piston Miner, how you doing? Um, okay, so... Oh, we can actually do this. Rust will automatically turn that into a mutable pointer for us. Yeah! Fuck yeah! Okay, so we'll write to the ICR. We'll write the high part first. Then we'll write the low part. That'll cause it to latch and send out. We write it to 310 and 300. We divide it down by the, um, the size of a U32. In this case, a U32 is definitely fixed size. So I'm, I'm fine saying divide by four in this code. Um, and then we write that. And then in the case of an X2 APIC, uh, write the entire uh, 60, entire, 64-bit value in one shot to MSR OX830. Okay. Uh, of course, that works. So now what we can do is this code that was previously all fucky if the CPU is BSP, and I'm actually gonna cache that when we set up the core locals here. Um, yeah, when we set up the core locals, I'm gonna say uh, is pub is BSP bool, and this will, is this the bootstrap processor for the system? Uh, this is the first processor that boots and can be used to uniquely identify the initial core. This is often used um, to determine to determine which core does a uh, whole system initializations. So the BSP will do uh, initializations for these things. And then uh, is BSP, this will be equal to CPU is BSP. And you might be wondering, why don't I use CPU is BSP? Well, CPU is BSP is actually relatively expensive because that has to issue a, um, I think that's a CPU ID or a read MSR, whatever it is, it invokes microcode. So we cache the result of that. And that allows us to then say core is BSP. So if this is the bootstrap processor, then we only want to do this on this one core. Uh, 
apic mute apic is equal to core apic uh, lock let apic is equal to apic that as mutes unwrap uh, get exclusive access to the apic uh, for this core and then we bring up the other cores by doing an apic dot write icr oxc4500 and then this is the init this is the sippy and the sippy so this will bring up all the other cores and this should work fuck page fault page fault yes this is uh, ver uh this is vatter.0 okay cool i was able to very quickly see this um in fact another thing that i actually want to print here is cr2 which is the faulting address um on a page fault so let's do that in our in our handler uh and let's undo that fix so we'll break it again. And then in our interrupt handler, registers at exception. And we'll say uh, faulting address. Eh. Yeah, I think what I'm going to do here is uh, this is going to be where we print the interrupt code and the error code. Well, I kind of want to do it in one shot, but um, faulting address is equal to x question mark. Fuck. Yeah, I kind of want to make some of those fields conditional, but anyways, we'll uh, we'll put um. We'll put CR2 016x here, and then we'll do down here CPU read CR2. That's the faulting address. That's stored by the processor on a page fault. Uh, and we have to update CPU or shared CPU source read CR3. We have read and writes to CR3, and we're going to copy this for CR2. Um, S, CR3, CR2, G, oops. S, CR3, CR, R2, G. Okay. So now we have a way of reading CR2. Now, if we run this, this will fail. And we should see, here's the faulting address. We were trying to access 310. And this is a very obvious indicator to me that we are writing to invalid memory. Um, or we're trying to write to a physical address, which we can quickly determine is because we are not using vatter.0. Okay. Bam. All right, there we go. All the cores are online. So we were able to successfully bring up all the cores using the APIC that we initialized. And uh, we are disabling the X2 APIC right now. So let's put this back where it uses the actual feature set. This is going to use the X2 APIC. Um, uh, mute APIC on this, N not features here. OK. Now here, will it work with the X2 APIC? And it does. So that means we correctly use the X2 APIC or the APIC, depending on what is present on the system. And we can do a print here. And we can say print uh, writing, just to make sure, uh, writing to X2 APIC. And if we're using the X2A pick, we don't actually have to make that mapping. Yep, and it totally is. So uh, why are we getting that print multiple times? Oh, yeah, because we write it three times. OK. Nice. So now that's now we have an A pick driver, which is fantastic. It's only using one, one tiny feature of the A pick. It's not for all the possible features of the A pick. Uh, this is going to be initialize, initialize, initialize the local APIC uh, for the current running core. Uh, this will enable the X2 APIC. If it, this will enable 
the A pick and optionally, and optionally, if supported, comma, is that how you would comma that one up? And optionally, if supported, will enable the X to A pick. Um, perfect. Uh, what, it, what is he working on? I'm working on a, a bootloader and kernel all in Rust, which are used uh, to run a hypervisor that can be used to run arbitrary virtual machines. And then we'll use that to fuzz um, targets in different virtual machines. So it's mainly a research kernel for whatever I possibly want to do, but mainly it's for hypervisor development and for CPU uh, research. Do you plan your progress or do you just uh, do whatever comes to mind first? Yeah, I just do whatever comes to mind first, pretty much. Um, as a Rust nude, what does the dot zero do? Is it behaving like a, an array index? It's actually an index of the tuple. So that is the index when you, you have an, an unnamed tuple variant. So dot zero is the first member of the tuple. Dot one is the second member of the tuple. Um, just when I thought about learning Rust, I find this cool but too advanced. This is, this is not normal Rust. It's it's not to say it's not safe to say that this is normal Rust. We are writing an operating system. If you want to write high level Rust, high level Rust is totally a thing. But we are we are doing some pretty advanced things with Rust here. Um, are the interrupts always handled on the same core, or is this random? That kind of depends how you implement it. That's up to how you design your device. But typically, it's on the same core. Um, is it indexing? Yeah, yeah, that's the tuple instruct. And if supported, and optionally, and if support, yeah, I guess that makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> it totally makes sense. There's no reason to repeat myself there. Thank you for that. I agree. And if supported, we'll enable the x2a pick. OK, fantastic. So now we have an X2 APIC or APIC, depending on whatever is supported. And now let's get timer interrupts enabled. Um, so to do this, I might actually set up. So by default, all interrupts are fatal. Right now, any interrupt that we ever see is fatal until we implement a handler. So what that means is we can actually implement a handler in this X2 APIC context that'll be aware of uh, all of this stuff. So this is the initial count for the timer, current count for the timer, and divide configuration for the timer. So we're going to look in this one. We're going to keep this open because I want these numbers. And then in this case, we're going to look at the APIC timer stuff. Now, we're going to have to enable interrupts, uh, which is going to be interesting. I actually want to, I want to be able to unmask interrupts for just the specific interrupts we enabled. Um, and I think we can do that with the local APIC. So we're going to set the um, APIC timer. Here we go. The APIC timer is a 32-bit programmable timer. So we divide it down, its address at this. And this is the divide configuration and the initial counts and current count. Um, if this, it runs at a constant rate regardless of p-state transitions. If this, it may temporarily stop while the processor is in deep c-states. Uh, we don't put the processor in c state, so it doesn't matter. So what we want to do, we set up the divisor here. Um, at boot, it's 0, which is divide by 2, OK? Um, and we can actually get that clock frequency of the APIC timer. Yeah, we should be able to get the clock frequency from the CPU ID leaf 15. But the CPU ID leaf 15 is actually pretty bleeding edge. Um, so unfortunately, we won't be able to use that in many situations. It'll be the processor's bus clock or core crystal clock frequency when CCR that is enumerated with that, divided by the value specified in the DCR. So 
we'll want to program the DCR to a specific value. That's really easy. We might write zero because that seems to be default. It's really weird that they have a hole punched in here, this bit. It's pretty weird. Don't get me started on that CPU ID function. Yeah, it's really annoying, man. Good morning, Asabood. <laughs> um, so we set the LVT timer register, which is 10.8, figure 10.8. Uh, so we want to set this. Uh, yeah. So what we'll do is this will be um, enable the APIC timer. Pub unsafe FN APIC timer. Um, yeah, we'll say enable timer. Mute self. Oops, enable timer. And we'll see what we can do here. Um, we want to write to FEO. So this is uh, ETH, this right here. This is the divide. This is These are read only. The initial count register doesn't matter, maybe. I think it might actually, I think that's how we actually, um, we might want to zero that out. Okay. So based on the two different modes and I might make a wrapper. This is kind of a special case, but for anything that's 32 bit, which is most of the other fields, um, pretty much, yeah, pretty much everything is just a 32 bit field in which case, I think we're gonna do a unsafe fn write apic mute self offset. Uh, this will be a u32 will be fine here. Value u32, and this will be. So that has a special case because we only write one 64-bit value. Um, write to the apic for a given uh, MMIO offset. Uh, Write a val to the apic for a given MIO offset. Um, if the apic is currently in x2 apic mode, then this write will correctly use the CPU ID, uh, use the uh, write MSR. Okay, so we'll paste this code here. Here's where we do the writing. In this case, we'll do the offset divided by four. We're not validating that the offset is valid here because it doesn't matter. Um, we'll assert that the offset is less than uh, 1K at least. Uh, APIC offset out of bounds. Um, it is up to the caller to make sure that the offset correctly indexes a 32-bit uh, and we'll say this, assert offset is less than that, and offset and three is zero, uh, or on aligned. Okay, it's up to that, a 32-bit valid APIC register. Okay, so uh, in this case, we just write the value. Um, this will be write the value using the uh, APIC, and this will be write the value using the X2 APIC um, MSRs. And that will take the 800 plus the offset divided by 16. In fact, the offset's actually always gonna be divisible by 16. Um, plus the offset divided by 16. Technically, we don't need those parens. I like having them, to be honest. So offset, so in the case of 300, we divide by 16. That gives us 30, plus that would give us 830, and then we can write that value. Um, so that's the range that we have here. Uh, just some very basic tests of validity. Okay. 
So then in here, uh, slice indices must be of U size. Yeah, we'll just say U size then. Um, val. Ah, val is U64. Oh, zero extend it. 56. Oop, expected U32 as U32 here. Okay. So now we have write apic. So now I can do self.write apic. And this is the address here. So we'll say, oh, it's, um, uh, 3e0. And we'll write a 0. Uh, set the um, timer divide counter to divide by 2. 0 means 2 in this case. Uh, timer divide register. Um, this will set the initial count to 0. Yeah. Um, set the timer. Oh, current count. That's the current count, right? 380. Oh, initial count is, okay, we'll get to that in a second when we figure out what we're doing. We need to set up the LVT. Um, LVT timer register at 320. So I'm guessing this is gonna disable the timer. Um, disable the timer if it is already running. Um, then, APIC timer, that's for handling local interrupts, can be configured through that for one shot or periodic, in one shot it'll start, it'll, it is started by programming its initial count register. The initial count value is then copied into the current count register and the countdown begins. After the timer reaches zero, a timer interrupt is generated and the timer remains at zero until reprogrammed. In periodic mode, it is automatically reloaded from the ICR when the count reaches zero. So the initial count is actually what we want. Um, this is at 380. And this is what we'll count down from. So let's say uh, we'll start with a billion. Um, program the initial count. This will be decremented until uh, it hits zero, at which point an interrupt through the uh, APIC timer LVT entry, the local vector table entry, um, will be fired. So this programs it. This is that starts the timer. Right? Automatically reloaded from that. Uh, the initial count registers read writes, blah, blah, blah. If during count it is set, counting re will restart. A write of zero to the initial count register stops the local APIC timer both in one shot and periodic. OK. So disable the timer by setting the initial count to zero. That's what the documentation says. A write of zero to the ICR, the initial count register, uh, stops delivery, uh, effectively stops the APIC timer. OK. Um, so I think we disable it. We then re-enable it here. And what we want to do is we want to program. We want to program that entry. So these are the different local interrupt tables. Here's the timer interrupt. Uh, so this is saying the um, one shot periodic and TSC deadline mode. So, so we're going to use uh, periodic mode. So we'll do um, let apic uh, timer LVT. This will be equal to uh, two shift. Uh, that's actually one shift by 17. Uh, and we'll make some constants. Const periodic mode 
uh, U32 is equal to 1 shift 17. Uh, so we'll say periodic mode, program it in periodic mode. This is the, whether it's masked or not masked. So we're going to say it's not masked, so we're not going to do anything there. This bit, what is this bit again? Oh, that's the delivery status. And then the vector. This is the interrupt vector that will be fired when the timer counts down. And this is at 320. So we're going to say we want to fire on OXE0 is going to be our interrupt vector. And we'll do self.write apic OX. This is at 320. Um, we're going to write in the apic uh, periodic mode OXE0. Um, program the apic timer to fire uh, to periodic mode and uh, use interrupt vector OXE0. Okay. And we'll make constants for those once this is working. So this uh, should basically silently do nothing because we haven't enabled interrupts. Um, so we're going to do asm uh, STI volatile. And this will enable interrupts. Let's see if we get an interrupt on E0. We might get a spurious interrupt. We also have a pretty big divisor on that. Oh, we never call this function. <laughs> so we'll do this. Uh, apic dot um, enable timer. Should fire. I don't know. That that billion might be a lot, to be honest. So let's drop that down. We'll go to a million. There we go. Okay. Um, interrupts are enabled. Apic dot enable timer. Okay. Whoa. Yeah, set the initial count to that. Set the divide. All right, here we go. Hmm. Um. It, it the first one didn't really matter because that was just to disable it. But anyways, we disable it by writing it to three eighty. Then, STI, that enables interrupts, right to 380 with a 0. OK, 380 with a 0. Disables. 3E0, divisor of 0, which is 2. And then program the APIC timer at 320, the LVT timer register. That should be 832, which makes sense. Uh, that's what we'll write the MSR to, write the value, periodic mode, then we'll or it with E0. Okay. And then we'll program the initial count. So it'll be decremented until it hits 0 by writing 380. Um, there's probably a bit I'm missing somewhere. We got the vector. We got the delivery status, which is 0. And then masked and not masked. I'm pretty sure we want not masked. Let's read the footnote. And that's in periodic mode. Um, one shift 17, yep. Mask. When a, ooh. When a performance monitoring counter interrupt is generated, the mask bit is set. Okay, yeah, yeah. Delivery mode, by default, it's just fixed. Delivery status. And that's for the timer at 320. Uh, 
Um, and that should enable interrupts. Uh, print timer enabled. Unless I'm deadlocking. Nope, timer enabled. Vector E0. Hmm. Uh, when the APIC timer specifies, or signals interrupt, yep. Lint zero. Value after reset these, okay. Um, is this because I haven't set the pick? But I don't, I don't think that's necessary. But let's go, uh, let's go grab that code from, um, Sushi roll source, oh, kernel source, uh, interrupts. Interrupts disable and enable, yeah, mm hmm. Interrupt frame. But we're not, we're never hitting that interrupt. Don't you want to enable interrupts before you... You know what? Honestly, that might actually be it. It might be firing and then I'm not able to... I think you're right. Uh, not quite. Um, you know what? I think... I think this APIC... I think I need to EOI this APIC. Um... I think an interrupt probably came through. Maybe someone else registered a timer before we uh, used it. So we need, <coughs> we need to uh, handle interrupts. And to do this, IPI, don't do anything. Um, so I think we might need to send one to the EO. I think interrupts are blocked because there's probably an interrupt that came through and we never EOI'd the APIC. Um, so let's do this, uh, self dot write APIC. And we'll send this to the EOI register. We might need to uh, program the pick as well. Um, interrupt acceptance, LVT, blah, blah, blah. Let me see where EOI is mentioned. It, it is at B0. So B0, you just write anything to it. And that basically says uh, end of interrupt. And that's not doing the trick. So um. We should have no interrupts. We might have to program the pick here. I don't think that's necessary. I know I know I've done it in every other kernel I've done, but I don't think it's necessary. Um, uh, pick in it. So this is to enable the pick. We're just gonna smash this in here for now. Um. I'll go through what this means if it works. No. Uh, let's EOI the pick. Actually, get rid of these masks. Okay, and let's send an EOI on the pick and then an EOI on the ape on the uh, um store the mass I await 
disabling. If you're going to use the local A pick and the IO A pick, you must disable the pick. A1 and 21. FF and FF. So right to A1 and 21. Disable the pick. Okay. You must first disable the pick. Okay, so let's do that. Let's disable the pick before we do any of this stuff. So that's where we enable the apex. This is going to be uh, disable the the pick. Uh, twenty one and a one. In this case, it says a one then twenty one. That's the slave and then the uh, master. So. A121, you must first disable a pick. Okay, so disable a pick. Then we enable the A pick. Let's see what we got here. Maybe I just fucked up these vectors somehow. Interrupts are enabled. Do I disable interrupts like an idiot somewhere here? No, I don't think so. Oh, I hit halt. In halt, I disable interrupts. I see all I halt on my interrupt stuff. So let's just loop. There it is. Easy. So disable the pick. Okay. Now. Well, that was easy. Um, unsafe. So that'll disable the pick. Now we're using the local A pick only. The old pick is fully disabled. I don't think we have to remap it. And now, um, okay. A pick, disable the pick. Great. Then we reprogram the APIC um, with a new settings, effectively enabling it. Okay. Let's take a look here. Reset this. Okay. We got interrupt E0. So now what we can do, if we don't enable if we don't enable interrupts here, we won't get that at all. Yep, no interrupt. Perfect. So enable these interrupts here. Great. So the pick is disabled, and then we can enable these interrupts, and then we get to this stage, and we get an interrupt E0, which is great. Um, okay, so we care about handling local interrupts. So I think I want to do is I want to mask everything. By default, they are, oh, by default, everything is masked, which is good. So if we disable the pick, we can enable interrupts, and everything is masked. Uh, value after reset. We might want to reinitialize all of these just for safety in case the BIOS or something uh, enabled these. So I want to turn those off. OK. Um, oh shit, I'm gonna do some next level stuff. Fuck. Uh, so when we reset the, um, when we have these interrupts enabled and we, let's see, when we go back to do our soft reboot, we don't, we don't want this timer enabled. If this timer is enabled and we go to soft reboot, we might get an interrupt in real mode for a timer that was, uh, all fucky. So what I think I'll do is I'll actually, on the A pick, I'll have a structure which tracks if the timer is enabled. And if the timer is enabled, then I'll implement a drop handler on A pick, and then at soft reset, I will just destroy, um, I will destroy the entirety of the core locals. And the core locals getting destroyed will cause all of the drop handlers to get invoked, and that's where we'll put like devices and all these different things, and it will cause everything that we initialized to get uninitialized if. Uh, there are drop handlers, so we'll actually be able to... Wow! Wow! I understand Rust so much better than I used to. 
My first Rust kernel did not do any of this stuff well. Oh my god. This is so much better. Okay, so easier. Let's register an interrupt handler now. So here we'll do, we'll make a um, uh, unsafe fn timer interrupt. And this will take uh, uh, what are all the fields that this takes? It's the same as this. Um, number frame. Um, error and regs. And I don't know if I want to make this associated or not. And then this returns a bool, which uh, tells if it's handled or not. We'll say false. And what we'll do is um, register an interrupt handler for, uh, and then we'll say const uh, apic timer vector. U32 is E0. No reason for E0. This E0 is just whatever we want it to be. That's just the interrupt pin that's going to be used for that. Register uh, interrupt handler for this. Oops. For apic timer vector. And then we do, um, we'll do this so the lifetimes aren't too crazy. Uh, core um, interrupts as mute unwrap um, what we call it add handler add handler for a big timer vector and we'll say as u8 here actually add handler for this and the handler is self timer interrupt. Okay, and then if that's, that'll panic if it doesn't succeed. This needs to be a U32. And then we have some things that we just need to pull in from uh, interrupts, interrupt frame, and all regs. Uh, crate. Okay, 75 as mute. Uh, lock as mute. Register a handler. Okay. Uh, print timer interrupt. Fuck yeah. Make an interrupt handler. So we should get that print and then we'll get the exception. Timer interrupt. Fuck yeah. Now what we can do is we can say it's handled say that it's handled and we'll still only get one which is going to be weird because we expect multiple but the reason we get one is because we don't EOI the APIC and to do that we need to do core APIC uh, lock as mute unwrap EOI fuck yeah no implementation of that that's easy pub unsafe fn EOI, mute self, uh, signal the end of an interrupt. And then we do uh, self dot write apic to OXB0 of a zero. That's going to EOI. This we can inline. Uh, we don't need to inline it. Uh, timer interrupt, and then we uh, EOI the apic. So, or I'll write it out. A uh, signal that uh, we have handled this interrupt and we're done with it. So that's an EOI. Okay. Do I need to re enable the timer? No, I have it in periodic mode. Um. Oops. Uh, I think what's going on here is, so we EOI the APIC. Is it is it at B0? Let's make sure it's at B0. Um, 
pretty sure it is. EOI register. Oh, of a non-zero value, causes a GP. Yeah, we want to write a zero. Oh yeah, let's try it. Let's try and write a one. See what happens. I'm just curious if this will cause a GP fault. Ooh. Right, MSR of a non-zero value causes a GP. No, well, we're not seeing that. Uh, or we deadlocked. Did we deadlock? Did we deadlock? Um, do we access the APIC in the page table? I don't think so. Um, oh. We prob- yeah, I think we're deadlocking. Okay. Uh, I think the reason we're deadlocking is, um, because we print here, to be honest. <laughs> Core, uh, we still have the lock in this stage when we enable timer. And then let's go to here, enable timer. Yeah, we don't want to enable interrupts yet. So register an interrupt handler for this. This will EOI the APIC. And then we want to uh, pub fn able interrupts. Uh, pub unsafe mute self. Well, we don't need that to be, okay, that can be in uh, CPU. Uh, enable interrupts, inline, pub unsafe, fn, uh, enable interrupts. This will just unconditionally do it, asm, sti, um, volatile. And we'll put a memory clobber on this. Enable interrupts. This will disable interrupts. Disable interrupts. Uh, CLI. Oops. CLI. Memory clobber at volatile. We don't need to say it's Intel syntax, but we will just because that's what we've been doing in the rest of the code base. Memory clobber, and then this technically clobbers uh, flags. Technically, uh, those are part of the flags uh, registers. Okay, so now this won't print anything because nothing will happen. Perfect. And then in main, uh, we can unsafe. Uh, yeah, here, at this stage, we can, uh, CPU enable interrupts on safe. There we go. Uh, uh, uh. Um, uh, we'll do this. We'll enable before just to see, but I'm not sure if it does need to. I think there's a chance that we're enabling that interrupt and then we're masking it so we can't EOI it. No, okay, uh, we, what did, what did, what did we break? Enable interrupts, STI. Uh, is it that loop? That loop's probably getting fucked. Oh yeah, we got rid of the loop. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, loop. We can totally enable interrupts after the fact. Uh, okay, timer interrupts. Yes, and this was gonna deadlock. A uh, yeah, 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 yep, 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 yep. Uh, we'll just put it here. Ah, oh, fuck.
There we go. Timer interrupts all day long. Okay. So here we can enable interrupts. Uh, and then here, bring up all other cores, enable the APIC timer, and then here we'll loop forever. Um, I could change my halt to actually not change the flag potentially, because right now I have it see, uh, clear flags, but I might just want it to um, persist what that flag is. And then, okay, so now we have a timer interrupt. interrupt. Right, right. And I might change halt. Yeah, I'm going to change halt to literally just halt in a loop. And that means I can go to a lower power state. OK. And now interrupts will just persist from what they were before. OK, there we go. Timer interrupts coming through. And what I want to do is, all right, so if I do a soft reboot, I bet this won't I bet a soft reboot might not work anymore. So if we'll actually do a soft reboot on, oh, we can, hmm. Mm. Timer interrupt. Um, this is handler. Uh, for timer, uh, APIC timer interrupts. Okay, so there we send the EOI. And what we can do here is um, we're going to do an unsafe create soft reboot. See what happens if we do this. Okay. Uh, it looks like that did stop working, which is good. That's what I want. Um, and I think the reason for that is because interrupts get enabled here. And then we get an interrupt, potentially. Uh, CPU disable interrupts. So we want to go to the soft reboot point here. Um, can we soft reboot in this state? Holy shit. Gifted subs, forklift, and thank you so much. Gretsuku, thank you so much for the sub. Oh, we got that sub train going. Hell yeah. Thank you so much, forklifting. All right, let's see if we can get this. Um, here, here's what we're going to do. On a timer interrupt, we're not actually going to do anything. Uh, we're going to get access to the serial port. Uh, serial is equal to core boot arg serial lock. Uh, as mute, unwrap. I don't think I can do that. Um, I don't think I can bind to that. Oh, I can. Why have I been doing that multi-line in a lot of places? I mean, that's not going to work, but why have I been doing that multi-line in so many places? I'm going to have to clean up a lot of things where I'm doing that. I feel like... I had issues where the lifetimes weren't right on this. Uh, let's see. Let's see if I can do serial dot write b moose. Oh yes. Okay. I can't do that. Perfect. Okay. So I wasn't fucking up the other spots. Let serial is equal to this. Thanks for all the follows and subs. Forklift, you're amazing. Thank you so much. We're gonna we're gonna get some good stuff going here. We got mooses. Okay, so now we're going to, now we're going to, in our serial driver, uh, shared serial, we're going to make a um, read, read byte. Um, you know, honestly, in this case, this will actually be acceptable. Uh, serial ports, reading from it, blah, 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 receiving data, nb port plus five, plus one, okay. So, fn read byte mute self. Uh, actually, yeah, read byte. This will take a port u size, a byte to u8. Um, ooh. 
Yeah, it's kind of hard to read from a port if you don't know which port you're going to read from. So we'll read from all ports. That's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to go through every port. Yeah, com ID for each byte. So we don't know what ports actually exist. Uh, read a byte from whatever com port has a byte available. It's a really weird API. It's a really fucking weird API, uh, but it's actually acceptable in our case. If let sum uh, sum port is equal to self dot. Oh, in this case, we can just do for port in self dot devices. If let sum port is equal to port uh, devices. Uh, if CPU in eight port plus five and OX, I think 10 or some shit. Oh, and one. If this um, while it's zero, so if this is equal to zero, continue. Um, check if there is a byte available. Uh, no byte available. Uh, Go through, oh, Napalm, thank you so much for the sub. Fuck yeah. Go through each device. Uh, get each um, if the device is present. OK, and then at this point, we can do a return CPU in 8 of port. And this will be a sum. So this will return a byte. OK. Uh, in this case, uh, none. No bytes were available. Um, no bytes available. And this will be uh, read the bytes that was um, read the byte uh, that was present on this port. OK, and ref that, and ref this. Oops, um, ref this whole thing. Oh, these are unsafe. OK, uh, pretty much this whole thing is unsafe in here, so I'm fine with this scope. Read a byte. Make this pub. OK, go through all devices, see if there's a, a byte available. If there is a byte, then in B on the port. Plus 5 returns if the uh, data is available. A uh, plus 5 is the offset into the port. So the port has multiple different uh, locations, like command registers. And we're adding 5 to get the fifth command register. And that's a status byte. So we're reading the status byte. We're seeing if the status byte indicates that there's a byte uh, available. And if there is, then we'll read it, and uh, that's what will return out. So I should probably drain that queue um, when I initialize the serial port. Port is a pointer, N kind of. Uh, it, it's a it's an I/O port, so it's not exactly a pointer, but it's kind of similar. It's it's like a different address space on xd six. Okay. So now, what I can do is where I print moose. Uh, actually, yeah, this is what we're going to do. Uh, let byte is equal to uh, serial dot. Honestly, we can just do read byte. Um, as mute dot. Oops dot unwrap dot read bytes that'll make sure that the lock doesn't last for more than that one line which is good and then here we can uh, print got a byte x uh, if let sum uh, byte byte 
is equal to bytes, then we got a bytes. Bytes. Super simple. Okay. Uh, read byte. Expected an argument. Yeah. Why the fuck would that take an argument? Okay. Why does that need to be mutable? Read a byte from the serial port. If one is available, then we'll EOI the APIC. Okay. So, F, A, B, A, S, D, F, Q, W, E, R, T, Y. I'm typing. I'm typing. I'm typing. All right. It works. Okay. Um, got a byte uh, here, and we'll print a character. Uh, char? As char? As char? Can we do that? Oh, wee wee. <laughs> Hello, world. How are you doing today? Backspace, backspace, backspace. Space, 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 space. ASDF, ASDF. Lowercase, lowercase things. All right, it works. <laughs> Someone is losing his mind. Wow, 3D GPU driver next. <laughs> Uh, if you want to use this stream as your window to get into systems or kernel hacking, hell yeah. All of those great references. <laughs> okay, perfect. So it's a really weird serial driver because we don't actually drain the serial buffer here. Um, we're going to do that, I think, up here. Uh, here we initialize the serial port. While let sum this is equal to ret dot read byte read byte here we'll say uh drain the serial ports of all uh bytes so we just reinitialized it which i i'm hoping would do that but we're just going to drain the bytes here while let this uh drain the serial port of all inbound bytes drain all serial ports of all inbound bytes so while let some read byte consume those perfect and this should still work uh, that just changes the init phase and it just makes sure that the serial port has been drained uh, for our soft reboots ASDF perfect okay so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have if let sum byte Z print soft reboot and why is that, why capital Z well it happens to be that shift Z is really easy on your hands and your wrists. So that's what I do. That's what I've always done. So if I hit shift Z, it'll print soft reboot. Okay, and that means that we can now unsafe. Um, I think, well, we're gonna reinitialize the APIC. Uh, I think we might want to actually disable the APIC first. This is probably going to fail. Um, let's see what we get here. We're going to try and soft reboot. So we'll go to create a soft reboot. And OK, Z. OK, now that got stuck. So I was able to do it once, right? So I booted it. And then I'm about to hit uh, Shift Z. Here we go, Shift Z. I was not clicked on it, I don't think. Uh, Shift Z, soft reboot, and we got a reboot, which is great. Um, but when I do it again, Shift Z, we don't get it. We only get it the first time. Um, Shift Z, and I also wanna see if I Shift Z a couple times, I wanna make sure that buffer gets drained. And it looks like it does. Okay, Shift C, soft reboot. And then that's getting stuck. So that means we're deadlocking or something's not initializing correctly. Uh, we never EOI the APIC. Let's do that. Let's EOI the APIC and let's disable interrupts. Let's do that too. Let's see, we got reset. Soft reboot? Yeah, and we can't do it again. Why? Why? What would cause that? <laughs> I 
Same stream as last night? Hell yeah, it is. Had you stream in the background while working? Heard you laughing as a mad scientist? Had to follow. Hell yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone for all the follows and all the subs. Um, I think we're uh, pretty much at Twitch partner status here. <laughs> we're like, we're definitely exceeding the uh, requirements for it, I think. It's pretty fucking crazy, man. Gonna get that Twitch partner. Okay, soft reboot. Uh, what's our problem here? We might actually want to disable the APIC. I think we might want to disable it and then re-enable it to reset it, potentially. Um, let's see if there's a way to do that. Uh, uh, let's see if there's a reset. Um, when that is set to zero, cannot be re-enabled until a system hardware reset. Okay. So, yeah, we're never going to disable the APIC. Um, when that's set to zero, it might be lost. It might return to this. Processor APICs based on the three-wire APIC bus cannot generally be re-enabled until a system hardware reset. Three-wire APIC bus? What, what is that? Is that like an atom or is that a common thing? Processors, processors using an FSB, a frontside bus, when that's set to zero, prior initial decision may be lost, and it might return, and it may return. Okay, well, that's very unconfident. Holy shit. So I guess there's no way to reset the APIC. Holy hell. Wow. Um, so we're going to have a uh, disabled APIC timer. This will disable the APIC timer. Uh, so what we'll do here is we're going to uh, disable the timer by setting the count to zero. And then here, uh, set the APIC, uh, APIC timer, uh, mask, mask off the APIC timer uh, entry. So self.write APIC, we'll write to 320 and the value we want to write is just a single where is it at handling local AP, uh, LVT we want to write this bit mask 16 uh, one shift 16 okay uh, disable timer so this will disable the timer and then this will uh, set the timer entry to be um, masked off and it will invalidate all the other bits so this will mask off the timer entry we'll make constants for some of these things in a second so some of this stuff is a little bit uh fucky so at this stage uh here we'll do disable timer at the start uh, self dot disable timer um disable the timer before reprogramming it great uh, yep, no unsafe needed here. So here we're going to, I'm going to disable the timer here, uh, self. Oh, this is, uh, APIC. Uh, core, APIC, lock, as mute, unwrap. Disable the timer. Oh, um... Interrupts are already disabled, so we're going to disable the timer. Yeah, disable the timer. Uh, send an EOI. And then we're going to soft reboot. And I think I might need to IRET here. If I don't IRET, that might be what's fucking me here. Um, control Z. Soft reboot. Oh, it works now. It works now. Okay, uh, we just needed to disable the timer. Um... Soft reboot requested. Then we'll perform the soft reboot. Uh, so disable the APIC timer. Um, EOI the APIC. And then this is going to be a soft reboot. Okay. And that means that we can go into main. And we're just going to add a print here. This is like we did before. 
This will be the RDTSC, just so we have a unique number. And here we'll do a reset. Z, 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 Z. So there we go. We can reset if we send a Z to the serial port. Now, let's try this on hardware. Let's get this hardware rebooting. Tootin' and rebooting. Um, let's see, what we got power on the server. There we go. So, this is on real hardware. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to reheat some food while this boots. I'm starving. I haven't eaten in like 12 hours. Be right back.
I have so much here. I've got so much food here. Woo! Hell yeah. Oh, it smells so good. I'm so hungry. Okay, what did we do? Uh, we just got soft reboot working. Okay, this is native hardware. Shift Z. Oh shit! Uh, but then what happened? Why did it? Why did? Why did? It, why did it stop? <laughs> why did it stop? What happened? F. It like kind of worked. Fuck. Hmm. God damn it. What could have caused that? How is that even remotely possible? Like, I don't know of having a bug in my code. It sounds very unlikely. Hmm. I wonder if it's because I'm re-enabling the APIC. It's a hardware bug? Oh, yeah. It's definitely a hardware bug. All right. Let's add some debug prints. Uh, print core locals up. Uh, and we'll do this. Uh, core ID. Interrupts up. And then a pick up. That's when we enable interrupts. So interrupts should be disabled until this stage. Uh, so in this case, in the VM, works just fine. Okay, let's try it on hardware. And now we wait 30 seconds. <laughs> Did it actually stream for 12 hours? Thought my stream for long? Oh, I'm. this is standard. This is the standard stream length. <laughs> That's what we do here. See, here's the thing. Everyone always talks about being in, streaming in the right time zone or having EU-friendly streams or NA-friendly streams. And my view is why don't you just stream so long you cover both time zones? Then it's fine. <laughs> All right. Let's see. Shift Z. Oh boy. Oh boy. Wow. Hmm. Stream all the things, all the time. All right, I have no idea why this is not working. I don't even have the slightest clue. Um, It's not this, is it? It's not that. Where it's like polling forever. But that would make no sense. No, that, I mean, it wouldn't make sense, but it could be. Um, we might add some prints in the bootloader. We do get into the bootloader, but then it deadlocks on something. Oh my God, I know what it is. I know what it is. 
I mentioned this earlier in the stream too. <clears throat> when we switch back into real mode, we have to load a real mode IDT because we still have the long mode IDT. And when we try and do uh, int routines or when the, we basically fucked up the interrupt handlers for any devices. So if, if the Pixie stack uses an interrupt, we have completely unmapped its interrupt table. Uh, and it turns out that's bad, uh, dot com. Um, let's take a look here at, uh, yeah, so this will get stuck. Okay, yeah, that's easy. That's so fucking easy. I'm so happy I thought of this because this would have been an absolute nightmare if I didn't think about it. So, if I'm not mistaken, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the, um, a real mode IDT, I think, is um, uh, IDT base S GDT RM IDTG. I'm pretty sure it's actually, I think it's just this. Um, how big is an IDT? It is uh, 2 times 2 times uh, 256 minus 1. <clears throat> a, se uh, a segment, an offset, 256 entries minus 1. All right, how confident are y'all that we, we got this fixed? Uh, at this stage... Load a real mode uh, IVT, lit it, real mode IDT. I mean, I'm not even checking a manual. I'm just guessing that's the correct shape because I'm so confident that it's going to be right. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see if this works in this. Well, in this it works, but this is not the hard part, right? Oh, we broke we broke this one. Let's see. Reset. Z Z Z Z Z. Okay, that one's fine. Okay, we gotta reboot this machine. This will hopefully be the last hard reboot. <laughs> I streamed for so long. <laughs> I got scared in anime. Oh my god. All right. Let's read the manual. Mm. I'm pretty sure that is correct for a, a real mode descriptor table. All right, did we fix it? Oh, it's still not booted yet. Oh, all right. Shift Z. Yes! Yeah, get fucked! Woo! <laughs> Easy. Easy. Shift Z. Shift Z. Z, 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 Z. Fucking easiest shit I've ever written. All right. Let's see what we got here. First try. Okay. Uh, boom. Uh, oh, we don't have to. We don't have to reboot it. We can go on hardware. Oh, there we go. Here's our new kernel. Oh, nice. All right. Yeah, this is pretty good. This food's good. This code's good. This Twitch chat's good. Are y'all being good boys today? Life's good, man. Hell yeah. Always. Wow. Wow, that's beautiful. Bam. Bam. 
oh, what if we what if we corrupt the shit out of our kernel? What if we end up core pointer right vert right uh, volatile leak as mute u32 write a zero into that all right what happens uh that's unsafe i don't know i don't know why that's unsafe okay <clears throat> let's uh let's kill that kernel let's slaughter that kernel here we go reset oh we had some panics let's see shit uh oh Oh, can I actually shift Z in this state? Uh, no, because uh, interrupts are disabled. So um, what we're going to do, I got one quick fix. One quick fix. Uh, fatal uh, print uh, panic. Okay, fatal exception. If, oops. Uh, if the core is the BSP, else... Um, CPU enable interrupts, CPU halt, print, uh, fatal exception on BSP, waiting, uh, waiting for, um, soft reboot. Okay. Enable those interrupts, halt that shit up, let's go. Let's see what we got. Oh, fuck. Why can't I CPU halt? Okay, okay. Thinking. Colon thinking. D colon. Why does not why does it not work? Why does that not work? Replace halt. The, the halt is, uh, the halt doesn't clear interrupt flag anymore. I changed that. And now it just halts. <clears throat> the BSP is waiting. Waiting for soft reboot. Panic. Um, we have all the panics. Fatal exception on BSP, waiting for reboot. All right, all right, all right, all right. Enable the timer, just on that core. Um, what would be different about being in an interrupt frame? We enable interrupts, we halt. That'll wait for, we don't need to EOI anything. If the interrupts are masked, then we're fine. Mm. Did we deadlock the serial port? I don't think so. What's going on here? Oh, interrupt lock, interrupt lock. Whoop, 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 whoop. Let's put this in a scope. Whoop, 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 whoop. Okay. <clears throat> fixed, fixed, fixed. Um. I don't know why that immediately went into a soft reboot. Why is that going immediately into a soft reboot? How is that getting a Z? Unless it's not draining that buffer. Unless it's slowly leaking one byte into that buffer at a time. Hmm?
Um, I gotta make sure those other cores get a knit, and I am I doing that? Oh shit! Oh my god, guys. We've got so many bugs, can't even follow them. Uh, apic dot, uh, right ICR. C4500. <clears throat> We're not disabling all the other processors. Typically a problem. Um, disable all the other processors. At this point, that lock goes away. We're fine. We got no other locks. That looks fine. That looks fine. After we init everything, we're we're good to go. Uh, here we go. All right. Uh, Shift Z. Okay, beautiful. Okay, let's try it on hardware. Shift Z. Uh, we just panicked a fuck ton of cores. We had fatal exceptions on all of them. Shift Z. We recovered. Hell yeah. Replace that kernel with a fresh one. I don't care how panicked it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. I found the bug. Oh, let me fix the bug. Uh, okay. We fixed the bug. Oh, let's redeploy the kernel. Ah, oh, shift Z. Oh, there's the new kernel without the bug. Wow. Uh, I just I just init uh, twice, kind of adds a delay. It's not really necessary. <clears throat> Technically, I should do it in a loop for like a little bit of time. Make sure everything's all reset and good. <clears throat> Is soft reboot a feature you've had in previous kernels? Yeah, pretty much every kernel I've ever written. It's just kind of required for uh, dev on hardware, on physical hardware, in my opinion. I don't know how people do dev without this feature. I think I have fuzzing. Yeah, I do. Nice. Does this exist on Linux? There's something called kexec on Linux that's meant to be quite similar. Um, it's sometimes pretty spotty, but... It arguably exists. I think it's pretty limited in uh, environments that it can work in. Okay. So here's what I'm gonna do. Um, in APIC, I'm gonna print the timestamp counter of when the soft reboot was requested. And we got to reboot twice, right? Because now this one has the effect. All right, so this is the time it took to reboot. Um, it's this number minus this number. That, that was the cycles. And that's including, like, prints and stuff. And these prints are over serial, over LAN, and it's, like, super slow. But whatever. Uh dir is this and then dir divided by this is a what is this processor um uh 3.7 gigahertz uh 3700 1 2 3 4 5 6 float this up <coughs> So that's how long it took. I uh, wow, that was slow, man. 140 milliseconds to boot. Shit, unacceptable. Is it possible to reset perf counters? Yes, the TSC is not a perf counter, but you can reset the TSC as well as performance counters. You have full control of writing over the value that's in them. Fuck yeah. Oh yeah. 
now we can do rapid dev. And it's a relatively bulletproof kernel. Okay. So let's see. Um, what do I want to do here? I want to clean up this code just a, a smidge. Um, uh, at this point, the exception, the interrupt, is fatal, unhandled. Print all this shit. If it's BSP, we enable interrupts and we halt. Otherwise, we panic. Um, honestly, we'll just halt here. I think this will be good. And then 95 main. Why does that? Oh, yeah. Unnecessary unsafe because we're not doing anything. Okay, let's panic. Bam. Oh, yeah. Oh, and look how good those traces look. And those are those are atomically printed. Uh, and we should print the core that these interrupts happened on. Um, on core this. Now we can give this a core ID. Boo! Let's go. Uh, we'll close that. Reformat this just a smidge. Gotta run. Okay. This is on hardware. Remember, this is on hardware. We just rebooted. Oh, there we go. Exception on core zero. One, two, three. Fuck yeah. Easy. I eat I eat boogies. Thank you for the or for the sub. Fuck yeah. Well. <clears throat> what if the other kernels are still running successfully? Uh yes, I will the I init all other cores. So it's not very clear because I, I haven't polished the code yet. Um, this will basically issue a reset to all other cores, but the current running core. So by the time we're soft rebooting, everything has been like completely turned off. All the other cores. So that's, that's what that's for. Yeah, we hard disable all other cores. All right. Nice. Fuck yeah. Oh, that's so nice. Real hardware. Fast boots. Okay. Now here's what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to implement a drop for the core. So let's see. Uh, that code's done. Um, this code's done. Uh, SB kernel source core locals. Okay. Ah, I, I literally opened that. Um, what I want is this. And I want to do... This will have... Um, apic mode is what we'll do, and this will be a pub struct apic mode, apic mode. Um, and this will be uh, a local apic driver. I don't know, a local apic instance. And this will be the current operating mode of the apic. Okay, and then this will implement on apic mode. And we're going to move some things around here. We're going to squeeze some things a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. Uh, this will do mode. Mode. 90. Mode. Uh, X2 APIC. Not found an APIC. Uh, yeah, this is APIC uh, percent %s. APIC colon colon apic mode colon colon g okay now this is going to be an apic um yeah we'll just say let mode is equal to this we'll get the apic mode in this case the x2 apic is supported we'll return x2 apic which is just a marker 
And then we'll do apic is equal to sum apic mode. And in this case, that'll do the trick. Uh, that's a semi. Um, 80. Oh, uh, right ICR. Um, yeah, how do I want to do this? I might just impl all these on apic. Yeah, we'll just do this, self.mode. Okay, and then uh, self.mode. This makes more sense. And then all of these, we get rid of that. Okay, much better. Uh, 28. Need to make this mute, I think, for both of these. That builds cargo run clean, cargo run. All oh, this build times, fuck yeah. Easy. You're questioning a, a lock on two consecutive lines, yeah. This code's just not done yet. Um. Register an interrupt handler. Um, I want to actually unregister an interrupt handler. If I disable the APIC and re-enable the APIC, I actually will panic. Um, so yeah, we want to do the same thing. Apic timer vector, uh, D. This is the um, interrupt vector to program the Apic timer to use. Uh, timer vector. Okay. Now in the disable timer, uh, we'll disable the timer by writing that. And here we're going to mask off the timer entry. And then here we're going to register an interrupt handler. With this, uh, we'll deregister. And let's see, let's get this working on main. Here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna apic disable timer, and we're gonna re-enable the timer. And currently, this is gonna panic. Um, we'll comment this out, because that's that doesn't exist yet. Uh, this should panic. And it does. Uh, interrupt handler already installed for interrupt that. And then all the other cores panic, right? So I'm just going to get rid of this test shit. Control Z. Um, what happened? Did I lose it? Uh, I might have lost it. I don't know. Okay. Oh yeah, I can't I can't reset cuz uh cuz I broke it intentionally. Um, interrupt handler already installed for int number 224. Um, and that makes sense. So what I'm going to do is in interrupts, I'll add a deregister. And this one's going to be relatively strict. Uh, this is going to be um, deregister and interrupt handler for num uh, remove. And we're going to assert self dispatch num as u size is equal to sum handler um, handler not installed or did not match for d register and then at this stage mark it none this will make sure that we have to actually pass it the handler again um Cannot be applied to that. Okay. Um, unwrap or. Um, yeah, we'll map this into x as u size. I'm going to get that pointer of that function. Okay, perfect. And then we'll as u size this. 
Okay. So if the handler does not match uh, or it's not installed, then we panic. Otherwise, we will replace it with a none. And this will make sure that we, if we deregister one, we will tell it which one, uh, what handler we're using. And this is just a little strict. Um, but if we're deregistering an interrupt, we should know from which routine we're deregistering. So it's just uh, meant to be strict. Move handler. And same arguments. Okay, so this should now work. Oh, handler. Ooh, handler not installed or did not match. Huh. I don't think. Uh, I don't actually know how that works. How the fuck does that work? Handler not installed or did not match. That's why. I think map gives a reference to it. Oh, maybe not. Um... Okay. P will have a uh, self dispatch num as u size handler. Can you not do this? Can you not? You can't, you can't question mark print a pointer? Wow. Well, this is more apples to apples anyways. Uh, as you size. I really need to make my panics a ton. Oh, well, I guess this is printing in a different line. Uh, I'm going to not spin up the other cores just so I get less overlap on some of the spew. Let's see what we got here. All right. Wait a minute. It succeeded, and then why are we doing it again? Oh, um, wait. Yeah, because that'll do it during the interrupt handler. But how is it not registered? Oh, this is good. I like this. Oh, yeah, because I have that deregister it. I want to do this. We'll just disable the timer by setting that to zero. Disable timer is like uh, re completely remove the timer. Okay, this should work now. Uh, reset. Z. Okay, soft reboot requested, and then that's failing. Is that because the deregister is failing? Hmm. Um.
That should be able to panic. Saw a freebie requested. We are are we not getting here? There's a chance we're not getting to that stage. Yeah, um, we're deadlocking on that. But why? Oh, we're not, mm. Timer interrupt. Lock the serial, do this. Are you running the core A pick? Inside a disabled timer? No. I might be printing. Um, interrupts are locked. Interrupts are locked. Interrupts are locked. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, 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 yep. There we go. We're going to do this. We're gonna do this as mute, as ref, unwrap, dispatch, number as U size. Uh, this is gonna be the handler. Okay, you can get rid of this scope then too. Might be time to add deadlock uh, detection. Now that we have core locals, we can do that pretty easily. Um, handler is equal to handler. Oops. Okay, so we get the handler, and then this will allow us to unmap the handler while we're in an interrupt, so in a callback, and here we go. Z, 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 Z. Okay, perfect. So, disable the timer. Fantastic. Okay. So, that will disable the APIC timer, EOI the APIC, and soft reboot. Um, and I think if I EOI the APIC, well, interrupts are still disabled. So I don't have to do that yet. So here's what I'm actually going to implement. Um, basically, anytime we're explicitly disabling something or turning something off, that's typically a sign that we should be using a guard structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch the APIC to hold a... Um, and that's why we put it into a structure. This is going to have the timer option... Um, and this will have an APIC timer, I guess. I think. I mean, I can. <sighs> um, yeah, I think we'll do this. Bool uh, has the APIC timer been enabled? Okay, so what we're going to do here is. We're going to do uh, self.timer is true. Um, note that the timer has been enabled. And at this stage, we will say uh, self.timer is false. Uh, timer has been disabled. Both take mute, so we don't have to worry about races. Well, we don't have to worry about races at all because it's rust. Uh, impl drop for apic. Fn drop mute self if 
self.timer. Then we're going to uh, self.disable timer. OK. 234. Uh, by default, the timer is disabled. False. OK, so the, f the timer is disabled. Uh, 155, this is unsafe. OK. So now what we're going to do is this isn't going to get hit yet. So we're going to say uh, print disable a pick timer. We'll do this. It's not going to get hit, uh, but let's see. I want to make sure nothing works. OK, yep, that stops working. Perfect. Um, so what we're going to do is we're now going to drop the entirety of the core locals. That's what we're going to do. Uh, in soft reboot. Um, if we knit all the other processors, they get reset to original states, including their Apex, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see if Sandpile tells us that. I would assume that they are going to have their Apex re reset unmodified. Ooh. Okay. Um, yeah, the other cores aren't setting up timers. Hmm. Okay. If the timer's enabled, we want to disable it. And to do that, we're going to do a, um, Do I have access to the address from core, from core locals? Um, at this point, uh, I have the address here, but I don't expose it. That's going to give me a mutable, uh, Get core locals gives me a static ref. So I think to drop this, I need to do this. Um, we're going to do a, I guess we can make that. Oh, we don't, oh, we don't want to pub that. Yeah, we'll say uh, let core adder is equal to core. That's a reference. Const core locals as const this. Should be able to directly cast that. Okay. Um, use create core locals core locals. This is just testing code, but I'm... We're going to solidify this shortly. OK, check this out. Now it's mutable. OK, mutable, done. Uh, core pointer drop in place. And what does drop in place take? I think it's a mutable reference. Maybe it's a pointer. takes a pointer. Perfect. Core address. All right. There we go. Nice. So, um, and this seems to get stuck sometimes, and I don't know why. Maybe I rebooted during a reboot or something. Let's reset it. Oh, I think it was just getting, yeah. That, that. If I hold down Z, does this get broken? It does. It eventually kind of breaks. Um, 
And I don't know why. Um. Okay, so why is that getting stuck? Probably a deadlock. Hmm. And then this. I don't like that that isn't clearing that buffer as well. I kind of assumed that I would be able to read that serial buffer dry. Maybe I need to like... Yeah, I guess new Zs probably are coming in. Um, I might need to pull that for a bit longer. Can it deadlock during a knit? And it interrupt and it dead. So, uh, first of all, let's get rid of this. We'll see if that fixes it. I don't think it will. Luckily, it repros pretty easy. Ah, oh, son of a bitch. Really? Was that it? Was it disabling and re-enabling the timer? That shouldn't that shouldn't break it though. That's that's my problem, is that should not break it. I mean clearly it did. Um disable timer. Disable um, enabling the timer. We don't have interrupts enabled at that stage. We shouldn't. Uh, disable the timer with sending the count to zero. Mask off the AFIC entry. Deregister it. And then mark that it's disabled. Okay, that's really weird. Um... Try this. See what we got. Okay, that's broken right away. Well, yeah, that makes sense because we have it. We just fully disabled it. So I wonder if there's a race here, but there shouldn't be because interrupt should be disabled at this stage. Let's see. Maybe we just got lucky because this this one's not breaking. Um, oh, there we go. It broke. Stop it requested some. And that gets stuck. Hmm. Um... Oh. Uh. We shouldn't be able to get an interrupt in our interrupt. Is it when we're printing? Oh, do we have a print? We have a print. It's here. It's here. This is what happens. Uh, it panics if we, um, it's this. It's this. If the timer interrupt comes through that causes the reset happens when this print is occurring, we can't get this serial lock. Yeah, if we're if we're printing. Right. We're in the middle of print. We're in the middle of print, and then we, um, yeah, then we get this lock, and we're, we deadlock.
Okay. Use Trilock in the timer. Yeah, that's probably what we'll implement. We're going to have to change our lock uh, infrastructure to do that. How do operating systems handle this? They will uh, disable interrupts. Pretty much any time a lock gets held in a normal OS, they'll disable interrupts. So I could potentially disable interrupts any time I hit a lock. And that way, any time I hold a lock, I have interrupts disabled. I'm trying to think if that'll break anything. The, the print has nothing to do with fuzz and jump out, man. Come on. You gotta not call out people. Um, I'm trying to think if there's ever a situation where I need an interrupt to occur while having a lock held. And I think the answer is no. I think the answer is no. I don't think locks should disable interrupts. Should be able to reboot from a deadlock. That's really difficult, though. I think I do want to disable interrupts anytime a lock is held. Ah. Um. Um. Um, hmm. I don't know how I have Loxel. I don't know how I make Loxel aware of the interrupt level I I I don't want to I don't want to have to break this lock because this I don't think I need to I think I can just have this always be correct But this this is right this is where we're deadlocking right here. This is not in a reboot. Right? This isn't reboot code. So when we when we get to this stage, right? We're not rebooting yet. And we don't know if we're going to reboot and we can't sh we're not going to shatter a lock if we're not rebooting. I'm not deadlocking a print. I'm deadlocking on getting access to the serial port. Yeah. So I think the correct thing to do is implement something that allows me to oh maybe have like an maybe have like an interruptible lock or something like that. And if I'll probably have two different forms of lock. One that will be usable in an interrupt context and one that will not be. And if the one that is 
not allowed to be used in an interrupt context ever gets used while in an interrupt. It's just a hard panic of like you're grabbing a lock that's not marked interrupt lock. And then interrupt locks will disable interrupts when they're taken and they'll release the, they'll update the, the interrupt ref count. And then that way for structures that will never be accessed in an interrupt, we don't have to disable interrupts while they're held. But any interrupt, any lock that is ever held during an interrupt would panic. And they wouldn't panic on the race because right now we're only seeing these bugs on the race conditions. They would panic if they ever get taken in an interrupt. So we can have like core, uh, core bang in, a, in interrupt that we set while we're in an interrupt and then get rid of it when we're out of an interrupt. And... Um, So then we'll have a way to track if we're in an interrupt or not. Now, I don't know how we can use the lock cell crate um, if we're going to have it aware of core bang. So I might have to take I might have to take that out of the crate. Otherwise, I would have to give it access to like an in interrupt or like interruptible. So when I, when I make a lock, when I make a new lock cell, I can ha I can basically have a boolean that tells me whether or not it can be taken while in an interrupt frame. The question is, how do I have lock cell, which is a library outside of the kernel, how do I have that aware of whether I'm in an interrupt frame or not? Um, and I would have to pass... I think the cleanest way is to probably move lock cell into add a type parameter to lock cell, which provides a way to specify things. Um, I also want to have deadlock detection. Um, Want to cause memory corruption when the interrupt steals a lock? No, we're going to... Uh, well, the, the interrupt's not going to steal a lock. We're not going to allow that. The interrupt's going to get a lock like anything else. So it's either going to deadlock or it's going to succeed. Uh, I want to add... So let's add deadlock detection as well as the concept of an interrupt, interrupt lock. And if we want to do that, we need to be able to... Um, shit. It might literally just be easier to move lock cell into the kernel project so I can get access to core bang. Otherwise, I'm going to end up implementing traits and so much. I don't know. I mean, I could add a trait for like in interrupt or something like that, but that might get really cumbersome. Like the, the, the amount of glue code that I would implement to make these traits and these impulse and all this shit to get this library to work would probably exceed that of just having the library in the kernel. Like if in the kernel I had to make like a struct uh, interrupt notifier type and impl the trait for the lock cell and all this shit, it might actually get more complex. Um, although I don't want the code duplication because I want lock cell. If I ever find a bug in lock cell, I'm, I'm not aware of any and I don't think there are any at all. But if I were to find a lock cell bug, I wouldn't want to have to propagate it to two spots. So, I, yeah, I, I guess we have to do a trait. All right, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Ah, <sighs> you fuckers. Uh, we're going to do <laughs> pubstruct. <laughs> this is correct, Desu. You're, you're totally right. Um, we're going to implement a structure. Or we're going to implement a trait, a pub trait. Um, this is going to be... Uh, it's going to be like interrupt state or something. And what this is going to do is we're going to have a way of in interrupt bool takes itself. Uh, and this will return true if we're in, in an interrupt. Okay, easy. Don't 
don't take doesn't take self. How would I have access to the interrupt state if I don't take self? Oh, I mean, yeah. I guess, yeah, that's a, yeah. I, I see what you're saying. Can you actually do traits like this? I don't know if you can do traits like this. Can you? You can, you can do traits that don't return empty struck with a trait, yeah. Um, really? I feel like I've had issues with that before. What am I, what am I thinking of that you can't, oh, you can't do dynamic dispatch of, you can't have a trait, you can't make a dynamic object. So I couldn't box up a dyne interrupt state unless every single function takes a self. Yeah. For some reason, I was thinking I would have to have a self. I got bit by that before on, on uh, dynamic, dynamic stuff. Okay. Um, returns a true if we're currently in an interrupt. Okay. Then, um, and this will be like, uh, I don't know. Interrupt state. Mm, interrupt state. I mean, we can't. We can't really deadlock unless we have interrupts and interrupt. Can we ever deadlock actually? Can we deadlock if we disable interrupts on an interrupt? If I prevent ever, if I, okay. I don't think we can have deadlocks. I think literally this will prevent all possible deadlocks. So this will just be interrupt state or yeah, lock checker or something like that. Um, and the reason why we, I don't think we can have a, um, so basically what we're gonna have is the lock cell is gonna have a, um, this is like the I, the interrupt state. Um, oh, how do we make sure that's rep or C? Oh shit. I passed lock cells from 32 bit to 64 bit land. Shit. Just just straight phantom data. Um How am I, how am I going to Fuck. Oh, because the wait. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, this is a relatively hard thing. Uh We can, we can do it. We can do it. I, I know the phantom data is zero sized. I was concerned because I need to be able to pass this from, I need to be able to pass this uh, boot args in memory as is from the, um, from the bootloader to the kernel, but I can actually do this where I implements, yeah. And then all of these will take an I. And then we do, since it's not actually held in data, uh, we can actually do that casting ourselves. We can we can unsafe cast this whole structure uh, from the boot args of the bootloader, which will have a different trait implementation to our trait implementation, and it will just work, right? Uh, we can literally cast the boot args i where i is bootloader uh, interrupt state and cast that to a kernel interrupt state, and it will just work, right? So that was my concern, and it does actually work. So any lock cell here, we're going to take an I. I. Okay. And then this is going to take an interrupt state. And then here we do um, 
uh, Interrupt states, uh, phantom, ugh, phantom data. Thank you for the phantom data, by the way, because I probably would have forgotten about that. Um, a holder of the uh, interrupt, uh, of the interrupt state traits for this implementation. Okay. Uh, yep, this is a use core marker phantom data. Okay. Uh, 66. The ref to a TI. I implements interrupt state. I interrupt state. I. I interrupt state I I interrupt state I okay um 30 yep TI and oh these ones as well ah. locks hill guard ti 32 yep oh boop done Okay, uh, interrupt state. Interrupt state. Um, phantom data. Is it just phantom data new? Or is it just phantom data? Uh, it's been a, it's, it's been a while. But thank you so much for the phantom data. It's it's totally the correct play. Um, how do I make one? Is it is it just this, or do I have to unsafe make it? No, wait. Um, really? What? I mean, we're we're just about to enable that, right? We're just gonna we're just gonna enable that feature. Um, that's bizarre. Can't have trait. Yeah. Um. I don't think swapping them will do anything. You mean like literally like this, but it, it that shouldn't do anything. Um, this is this is a real issue, and it's a limitation of constafen right now. Basically, we can't con. I mean, uh, fuck. I mean, I think we're just doing this, right? I think this is the play, right? Um, uh, 
Oh, that's uh, on boot args. Okay. Like, I'm just going to trust that it kind of works. It's just some bleeding edge shit. You can't constif you can't you can't constifend anything that is a trait bound. TLDR. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty fucking big limitation, right? <laughs> a pretty fucking big limitation. <laughs> but luckily we can kinda get by with it. We do need constfn pretty bad, right? We have to be able to use constfn. Because we declare these in globals. The lock cells. Um, so it's, it's pretty important that we can do that. We could always unsafe it, and we could have made it work if we really had to. Um, but in this case, uh, we can actually get by with this. And it, I'm, I'm guessing it does the right thing. Okay, so what we need to do is um, returns true for currently in an interrupt. Then we're gonna have lock cells. Uh, these are gonna return a um, uh, um, I don't know how I want to phrase it. I don't know if I want to say usable in an interrupt or interruptible. Usable in an interrupt means it's not interruptible, if that makes sense. Instruct log cell, you should specify default type parameter. Specify default type on the log cell structure? What do you mean by that, sorry. Wait, you can do that? I've never seen that syntax. Oh, this will be like, oh, I see. I see, so you do like yeet. And then I'd uh, struct yeet, right? Impl interrupt state for yeet. Fn in interrupt. Dude, I've never seen that syntax. That's completely new to me. That's like not something I read and forgot. It's like literally something I've never seen before. What? What? And is that, can you just do I equals? Like, is that a thing you can do? Okay, yeah, you can. So you literally just say that's the default implementation. And then if you omit that, pub, yep. Wow. You can have default type works, but not default to a function. <laughs> Hash mess would be pretty unusable without this. Yeah, that's fair. That's pretty damn nifty, man. Oh, yeah. Otherwise, you would have the, like, RNG state and hash map. Yeah, the hash state. You can emit interrupt state instruct parameters, but you have to specify in an impl trait. Okay. So that's fine. So whenever I create that, it'll just automatically use this. So this is, um, yeah. Wait. Oh, I see. Where I is yeet. I'm still going to do this just for 
just because it's like to me a little bit more clear what that bound is that I'm expecting. But uh, noted. Okay. <laughs> Yeet. <laughs> uh, okay. So here's what we're going to do. We have to implement a couple more things on this trait. This is, uh, we'll say, default interrupt state. Um, or this is going to be... Um, I don't know. I don't know if I want to have this have a default trait. I kind of want it to be pretty obvious and explicit what you're doing. I do appreciate that. Uh, but I don't want the... like. By having that default trait, it'll by default make unsafe lock cells all over the place. Unless you know that you have to specify it. So I actually do want to force people to specify it. Um, but I do like that syntax, and I, I will definitely use that. And I feel like there's a couple places where I wish I had used that already in this kernel. Fuck. Okay, so we have in interrupt. Uh, this is going to be disable interrupts. And enable interrupts. So this is going to be um, a lock which uh, does not allow interrupting uh, was taken and thus interrupts must be disabled. Um, it's up to the uh, callee to handle the nesting of the uh, interrupt disablement right so this is basically gonna increment uh, a ref count um, uh, a lock which uh, does not allow interrupting uh, interrupting was released and thus interrupts can be enabled again. Uh, it's up to the callee to handle the nesting of interrupt status. Uh, yeah. Uh, E.g. using a uh, ref count of number of interrupt disable requests. That makes sense. Uh, nesting. Okay. Yeah, we'll do this. Was released. And thus interrupts uh, can be enabled. So disable must. This can can be enabled. Set CC is uh. uh Set TW is 79. Okay, there we go. <clears throat> so, um, and I think this will prevent deadlocks because we don't have soft threading. The only place that we can deadlock is if a lock is taken in a lock or in a an interrupt. And what we're gonna do is all of our lock uh, our lock cells. Um, this will have interruptible. And this will be bool. This is uh, if true, this lock. Um, hmm. If true, this lock. I don't. I don't know. I want like used in interrupts or something. Y used in interrupt or like. Um, Let's see. Interruptible, I think, will be default. By default, it'll be interruptible. In the case of a... Um, I could call it, like, interrupt safe or something. Um, fuck. What do I want to call this, man? This is going to be the best lock structure I've ever had in my life. Uh, by far. Uh, for any of the kernels I've ever written, I've never had something that inherently prevents uh, all uh, deadlocks. 
This will prevent all deadlocks. It, it'll be literally impossible to deadlock, which is fucking crazy. Um, I just need to figure out how I want to mention this. Uh, this will be... So, by default, new... Um, disables interrupts. We'll do this. Will it panic instead? No. It just will never happen. It'll just literally be impossible to deadlock. It won't it won't have to detect and panic a deadlock. It deadlocks will fundamentally be impossible. Rust allowed de allows deadlocks. Okay, so this is going to be um if set to true, it is required that interrupts are disabled uh, when this lock is taken. When this lock is taken. And this is specifically when the lock is attempted to be taken, I think. Because after it's taken, yeah, we have to disable interrupts before, which makes sense. Uh, it is required that interrupts are disabled um, prior to this lock being taken. Do you know of any other currents with this feature? Uh, I don't think with this level of confidence. I mean, this is how most things do locks in the kernel, but they kind of rely on deadlock detection telling you, whoa, you, uh, you recursively locked. This will fundamentally prevent it. Um, which is going to be really, really, really cool, I think. Um, if set to true, it is required that interrupts are disabled prior to this lock being taken. Okay. And then this is uh, pub const fn. Um... Linux has a mode where you can enable, that does checking, lock dependencies. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that'll check for the deadlocks. I have a question, why do you spin locks on a structure only gonna access from a single core? Um, I guess all of these will disable interrupts then, if that's in that case. Well, um, let's see. It's not. It's fundamentally not necessary, right? But the biggest thing is I don't want to have multiple different. Uh, well. Uh, so right, we can have interrupts, right? At any, any time we can have an interrupt and there's nothing preventing an interrupt from accessing one of these data structures. And that is effectively uh, a thread. So anything that is possible to access via core bang has to be locked. Um, now we can eventually make a, a, a thread bang or like task bang that would get an, you would get a different task based on your interrupt or not. But for the core stuff, um, anything in core, but that's a ref cell. No, it's not on a, on a, with, and with an interrupt, it's the same as a thread. So it has to be a mutex. Technically, an atomic ref cell would work, but an atomic ref cell is the same as a lock. Yeah, and and uh, the re the reason for that is this. It, um, I know you probably understand it at this point, but uh, basically, uh, ref. This is in inside ref cell, right? This is in the implementation of ref cell. Uh, let's, and here's like the assembly move, uh, racks, uh, ref ink racks or ink racks move ref 
racks or whatever, or just an ink on ref, right? But this is this is the same as the ink of a DREF memory if it's not an atomic. Uh, if an interrupt occurs here and another thing grabs the ref cell, it's going to delete one of the ref counts. It'll disappear. So it's basically required, right? Because if an interrupt occurred here and then I grabbed the ref cell, then we would move racks ref, which has not been updated. We'd ink racks. And then here we'd uh, clobber it. Well, this we'd actually do the increment. And then at this point, we would like delete this, that that other ref happened at all. Um, Let's see, actually in this case, uh, does it matter in this case? Does it actually matter? Can we use a ref cell? Uh, yes. We do need to use a ref cell in this case. Uh, actually... Does it matter in this case? It needs to be atomic. Yeah, I think it depends on how the release is implemented. Depending on the type of lock that is used, it might not matter. But anyways, lock cells on a single core are cheap anyways. An atomic to something that only your core um, an atomic access to something that is in the exclusive state in your cache, which it will be because it's on your core, is cheap, right? So in my opinion, I would rather use lock cells than try and relax it and take a risk. Um, so yeah. So here we're going to do... Um, this one's going to... Um, Uh, new no preempt. Preempt. New no preempt. Val T self. Lock cell. And this has disables interrupts. False. True. Okay. Uh, creates a uh, a new lock cell which will disable interrupts for the entire time the lock is held. Um, okay. Preempt, preempt. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Preempt. I don't know. I don't. I, I'm trying to find like a, a smaller way of describing what I'm trying to do, but I don't think there is a better one. Anyways, disables interrupts false. Several disables interrupts true. Then, now what we can do when we take a lock, um, if self disables interrupts, um. So this is our laxed one. If it does not disable interrupts, and I an interrupt, and we can we can just say this assert assert that it disables interrupts, or it's not in an interrupt. Uh, attempted to take a uh, non preemptable lock in an interrupt. Can you use a method on the trait? Um. 
Um, um, yes. I'm trying to think if that will lead to expressibility issues down the line, but I don't think so. So we we would basically give it a different interrupt state. We would give it a default interrupt state that always returns false, effectively. Locks are constructed the same. And then you just give it a different I. Uh, actually, I think the answer might be no. Let me think through it. Uh, if we want to share it between... If we want to share it, if we want to share this boot arg structure between bootloader and kernel, we can't concretize these with a specific implementation. Um, uh, because I because I would have to I would have to implement a specific thing here. I'd have to say like interruptible. Right. Um, uh, the reason for that is the, the there are two different code bases sharing this library, and this library won't have access to this interruptible uh, structure because this won't exist in the bootloader, but it will exist in the kernel. And I can't put it in this. Uh, I can't put it in here. I can't make this. Because if I put it here, expert default struct from lock cell. Like yeet. But but how would I how would I change all of these lock cells to use a completely different trait? I, I unless there's some implement uh, unless there's something I'm not aware of. Because this structure, I can't I can't use the trait at this level if I want to have it per per lock cell. If I want to have this one be interruptible and this one not be interruptible and so on and so forth, I can't implement, we can't have I at this level. Uh, oh, I guess I could. Oh, I think I can do this. This one disables interrupts. This one enables interrupts. I could do this then. D, I, I. D, right, shit like this, where the ones that are D will use this one, which will, uh, in fact, those would just be the default, right? Oh, I think I see what you're saying. I, I, I think I see what you're saying. Um, I would only use I on ones that can be interrupted. And the, all the others would get the default. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that works. Right? Yeah. That works. That totally works, man. Brilliant. So I'd have interrupt state, struct, um, interrupts, disallowed. Oh, actually, we can't do that. No, 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 we can't do that. Uh, because when we actually need to check if we're in an interrupt in an uninterruptible one in the default, in the colon, colon, new. Um, we, we have to do it this way. 
because this is the one that actually uh, is an issue. If this one had the generic implementation, then we wouldn't have access to whether or not we're in an interrupt. Um, we, ha we have to go this way. Okay. And I'm fine with this. I have no problem with defining it as slightly different. Okay, here we go. Uh, bup, 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 bup. Lock cell. Undo, okay. So, does that make sense, Desu? But effectively, um, if the lock doesn't disable interrupts, which is the default case, I need to see if I'm in an interrupt, which is an OS-specific functionality that I can't, I can't implement a default in interrupt because there is no default way for me to know if I'm in an interrupt or not. That's an operating system level construct that will have to be exposed to me by the operating system. <clears throat> so, and that's in the default case. So, <clears throat> we're not gonna be able to make that work. At least in the way that I envision this, which is protecting against that. Interrupts are not enabled in the bootloaders, correct. Um, was a plugin that adds animations to Windows switching, uh, like moving these up and down? I'm just doing this with my mouse. Okay, disables interrupts, true. So in this case, um, if this lock does not disable interrupts and we're currently, and we're not in an interrupt, or yeah, if this lock does not disable interrupts and we're currently in an interrupt, then uh, we just used a non preemptible uh, emptable lock during an interrupt. This means the lock definition should, uh, the lock creation for this lock should be changed to a um, new no preempt. Well, with in an exception, we get, we can't do that. I think you still. You should still need to create a default struct for interrupt state so you can use it. In the bootloader, I'll make, I'll implement one in the bootloader that will just return open for everything. It'll just do nothing. It'll say in interrupt false. Um, and then disabling and enabling, inter disabling and enabling interrupts will do nothing. Uh, now where it gets difficult is exceptions. I can't block exceptions. Fuck. Okay, never mind. This whole thing kind of went in the shitter. Um, I think we still should do it. I guess in an exception... I will probably shatter locks. Can you just have more strict rules about what is allowed to be done in an exception handler? That's exactly what we're doing right now. We're basically enforcing that you cannot use a non-preemptible lock um, in an interrupt handler. In an exception handler, yeah, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to probably break locks in an exception handler because there's no way that we can potentially guarantee that we don't have a lock held. But that's fine. We can break locks on some specific locks. I don't want to do it on everything. And I don't want to break locks when I'm freaking... I, I only want to break locks in an exception. When I'm, when, I'm turning, when I'm tearing down the entire OS is the only time I want to break locks. I don't want to break locks at any other point. So we're still going to write this code. If... 
this disable interrupts, if this disables interrupts, or, uh, yeah, assert that this either disables interrupts or we're not in an interrupt. Okay. Then, uh, disable interrupts if needed. So here we'll say if self disables interrupts. If we disable interrupts, then we'll do an I disable interrupts. Okay, and then we'll grab the lock. Okay, sweet. And then here, when we release the lock, after it's been released, we can enable interrupts. Okay. Uh, self dot cell. Okay. Release the lock, and then now we can enable interrupts if they were disabled. If this disables interrupts, we'll enable the interrupts. In this case, we will disable interrupts, then we'll acquire the lock. And that means this panic will happen... Uh, so you can't take these locks before interrupts are enabled. Um, no, we can... It, in the case of... In interrupt will always be false, right? If interrupt is false, in, in the case of the bootloader, the bootloader where interrupts are disabled, right? In interrupt will always return false because we're not in an interrupt. Disable interrupts will be a NOP, and enable interrupts will be a NOP. And that means on the bootloader side of things, these will always succeed. Lock will always succeed, and drop will always succeed. In the case of if we're in a kernel with interrupts, if the lock is taken inside of an interrupt, and the lock hasn't been said that this cannot be taken in an interrupt, it will just hard panic. you won't call disable interrupts other than when you're inside an interrupt. Um, no, we'll call disable interrupts if we're not in an interrupt. Well, technically, this is going to increase the uh, ref count of disable interrupts. On the bootloader side, it'll do nothing. It'll do literally nothing. On the kernel side of things, <coughs> on the kernel side of things, um, if a lock has not been created with no preempt, if it's just a normal new lock, then if we attempt to access that lock in an interrupt, we will panic hard, regardless of if there's a race, regardless of if the lock is already held when the interrupt happens. It will just hard panic because it'll say, hey, you told me to not let you take this lock in an interrupt, and you're taking it in an interrupt. So this way, it doesn't have to do with races. It'll always be wrong. As long as the code executes that takes the lock in an interrupt, it'll always be wrong. It'll always panic. So what you have to do, if, if there is something that you want to access in an interrupt, for example, our serial driver, we want to access an interrupt so we can print. So what we'll do is we'll have a new no preempt for the uh, serial driver. And then that serial driver will be allowed to be used in an interrupt. However, whenever the lock is taken, it will disable interrupts. So if, if the lock is held, it is impossible for an interrupt to occur because interrupts are disabled, with the exception of an exception, because we can't block exceptions. But in an exception, we will shatter locks. So an exception will be a special case. I think the issue that Desi use is getting at, when a no preempt lock is released, it'll enable interrupts, even if they hadn't been enabled before the lock was taken. That's not true, um, uh, and that's just due to these, uh, these requirements. It is up to you, to the callee, to manage that these are going to get called, <clears throat> and you have to ref count your interrupts. So basically, you'll, we'll have a disable interrupt counter on our core structure. Every time we get a request to disable interrupts, we will disable interrupts, and we will inc increment the ref count of how many times we've had disable interrupts requested. 
And then when we enable interrupts, we'll decrement that ref count. And only when that ref count gets to zero will we actually enable interrupts. And that's why I say this. Um, in disable interrupts, a lock which does not allow interrupting was taken, and thus interrupts must be disabled. So when dis disable interrupts gets called, interrupts must be disabled. When enable, enable interrupts gets called, interrupts can be enabled if the OS deems it is safe to enable interrupts, e.g. they weren't already disabled. So in the kernel code, before interrupts have been globally enabled, uh, disabling will get a ref count greater than one so that a litter um, let's see that once again, that's up, to, that's up to the OS, right? <laughs> that's how it should implement. That's how it should be implemented. But yes, the ref count would start at one at kernel entry. We enter the kernel, the ref count starts at one because interrupts are disabled. Yep. But these are up to the kernel to get right. <laughs> Um, I don't know if I should mark them unsafe FN for that reason. Um, and that, that way they understand that these are like a little sketch. I could also like, um, yeah, disable interrupt. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I couldn't rename them if the name's just the confusing part right now. If this is all an issue of naming, I could maybe like, um, I don't know, like most operating systems enable and disable interrupts kind of imply the ref counting stuff. Um, I will mark them on safe though. Um, and that way, that way it's not safe to make an, a deadlockable lock. Ah! Deadlocks aren't unsafe. It's wrong, but it's not unsafe. Enter lock, exit lock. Um, I don't think enter lock and exit lock really apply, imply anything related to interrupts. I guess they could be like notifiers that the locks are being taken. Um, I don't know. Interlock. Because you are implementing them on interrupt states. Yeah, I think this is fine then. I actually, I think that's good. Uh, can be enabled. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. All right. Uh, 87. Enter lock. 119, uh, exit lock. Okay, now we implement this on the bootloader. Um, boot args. This will take a, um, we can give this a concrete type because it's a, a phantom marker. So here we'll say um, lock interrupts. And then impl a struct lock interrupts. Impl lock interrupts. Uh, interrupt state for lock interrupts. OK. But yeah, we're technically not actually adding any on safety. We're just adding the chance of deadlocks if you fuck up, uh, which is fine. Bool, uh, in interrupt is false. Enter lock, nothing. Exit lock, nothing, right? That's the bootloader's implementation because we're never in an interrupt in the bootloader. Uh, so here we'll implement, I'm gonna do this just so it's a little bit more explicit. 12, lock cell on pixie guard, uh, sp source pixie. 
Uh, and this we can make uh, SP, yeah, bootloader source pixie, 12, lock cell. Maybe I will make a default implementation. Eh. I don't know. I want it to be pretty clear. So I'll use that. Sweet. 257. Um, lock interrupts. Uh, in this case, we can just say const under. It'll figure it out for us. 28. Pub. Okay, now we have a problem on the kernel side. Sweet. So this is um, this is just a uh, empty structure to implement uh, locking semantics uh, for preemptible locks. Okay, so we're on to the kernel side of things now. Uh, kernel source main. Uh, kernel source core locals, we got it open. Okay. So now in this one, we're going to implement uh, struct um, lock interrupts, a uh, empty structure to implement uh, interrupt disablement for preemptible locks. Yeah? Okay, ample lock cell interrupt state for lock interrupts. Fn in interrupt bool core in interrupt. <laughs> Fn uh, enter lock unsafe CPU disable interrupts. Um, oh, and we'll do this, uh, core interrupt, uh, I don't know, um, interrupt level, interrupt depth, interrupt, uh, uh, request, yeah, I'll, I'll say interrupt depth, well, <laughs> I feel like that implies the level of the depth of the interrupt. It's actually the requesting. In fact, I'm going to eventually support nested interrupts in my... Well, actually, I do right now. I support nested interrupts. Uh, so we got to do this. This will be if... This will be interrupt depth is greater than zero. If the interrupt gr depth is greater than zero, um, and this will be dot load ordering sequentially consistent. If the interrupt depth is greater than zero, um, every time we enter an interrupt, we'll increment uh, interrupt depth. Yeah, interrupt locks held or like, hmm. Uh, disable outstanding fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent fn exit lock it's a long it's a long variable name but i think it's fine if core ah fuck is there a race here No, there's not. Um, interrupt disable outstanding fetch sub one ordering sequentially consistent. If this is zero, uh, is one. So it went, it transitioned, unsafe, CPU, enable interrupts. OK. Um, and we're actually going to implement this on core locals, um, these, kind of. 
Uh, this way we won't have to um, impl core rex or core locals. Do we already have an impl core locals? No, we don't. Wow. Okay. Impl core locals. Paste. Move these up. Impl core locals. Uh, and this will be disable interrupts. And this will be enable interrupts. And then here we can just call core disable interrupts. And this will be enable interrupts. And that way other people can use the same core disable and enable stuff because we'll probably use that in a couple other spots. Now we got to implement interrupt depth. Um, pub, well, atomic e size. Man, should that be pub on interrupts? Add a check on lock interrupt to not disable interrupts twice. It doesn't really matter. CLI is basically free. The branch would be more expensive than the CLI. Um, yeah, some of these things, mm, I'm maybe I shouldn't have as pub. Um. I really wish Rust had unsafe fields, but it doesn't. It's really frustrating. Um, ID, that we can't change. Is BSB, is BSP we can't change. I think I want to make these non-pub. Okay, disable interrupts, interrupt depth. This is the current level of, um, uh, current level of the interrupt, current level of the interrupt fr frame. Um, Current level of interrupt nesting uh, incremented on every interrupt entry and decremented on every interrupt uh, return. And I kind of want that auto incrementing. I kind of want to like borrow something off there such that I don't have to worry about dropping it in every location I return out of an interrupt. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff for us to do here. Um, yeah. Um, I might make an atomic ref count or something, uh, and then I could give out a reference to it or something. I wouldn't call it arc because that kind of has the connotation of holding a uh, value on the heap, but I think what I might do is just have like an atomic ref count library that will give out a lease to something and then decrement the ref count back. I mean, it's literally arc of an empty. I actually have arc. Does arc give you a count?
Um, yeah, there's strong count and there's weak count. But in this case, is art guaranteed to not cause an allocation if it's an empty type? I would assume so. Which means I could use arc as a marker. Is that gross? Is that unclear? I'm literally going to implement the same semantics, but uh, it w I could effectively do this, right? Right? And I can use that to clone it. When I get into an interrupt, I can clone it. It's literally what I'm going to implement, right? Arc is not constructible from const. Yeah, probably not. Um, well, in this case, in this case, I'm not actually creating at const time. This is not a const time creation because I'm making core locals, which is a uh, dynamic allocation at this stage. All right, what if I, what if I, <laughs> what, if, what if I assign this a different name or something? Or what if I strongly type arc? Or is it just too confusing? Uh, like, I want the exact same semantics, right? I want to give out a number. And then I want that number to come back when an object goes out of scope that I borrow, right? And I can implement that. It's not that hard. It's just a it's just a guard on a ref of an atomic U size, and yeah, that's about it. But arc does exactly what I want. Interrupt ticket. A ref that. It'll actually be a static ref. But yeah, we can a ref it to make it a little bit more uh, more usable. Well, we won't do interrupt ticket. I don't know. We can do interrupt ticket, uh, and then we'll do that as we'll do that for interrupt depth and for the oh my fucking god. Oh, it's just literally what arc does already. The issue with arc is it's a little bit unclear what it's doing. It's a little bit gross. I mean, I mean, you know. Right? 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 I feel like I won't be confused. <laughs> Desu's gonna have a conniption. Um. Yeah, it's a, it's a little unclear. I'll, I'll give you that. Uh, struct. Uh, we'll just say, like... Auto... Ref. Auto atomic ref.
right? Self. <sighs> I'm out. See you around, Desi. Thanks for all the help. New. Val and it you size and it pub fn pub const uh a um auto An auto reference decrementing an auto referencing uh structure uh which allows scope based ref uh reference counting of an atomic U e size. Pub FN ref self um, reference a struct auto atomic ref guard a an a auto atomic ref here we'll do a self dot Zero dot fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent. Um, auto atomic ref guard. Uh, self. Okay. Oops. Auto atomic ref guard. Um, oh, it's implied. We don't have to give it this. Um, okay. Um, can we actually do this with the enable disable interrupts? No, we can't. For enable disable interrupts, we cannot. But that's fine. We can use the use size for that. Auto atomic ref guard in this case. Um, yeah. Impl drop for auto atomic ref guard a a fn drop mute self self dot zero dot zero dot fetch sub one ordering sequentially consistent okay and pub all this shit Ninety six interrupt depth. This is auto atomic ref. It's gone here. Thirty six. Oh, I gotta do this. Uh oh, ref. Um, increments. Forty eight. Corn off on the scope. 
Oh, yeah. Put this at the very top here. Tippy top. Bam. Okay, 88. Boot args. Expected type argument. This is an I. Uh, this is a crate. Oh, we're doing it in this one. Lock interrupts. Beautiful. 92. A pick. Lock interrupts. Lock interrupts. Um, I might actually make that default impl. Oh, I can't. Yeah, I can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Never mind. Uh, I thought about that. Oh, okay. Uh, thirty count unmatched. Load done. Twenty three. Interrupt depth. In interrupt. Count. Uh, yeah, count. 56. So we'll get the interrupt depth dot count off of core. If this is greater than zero, then we're in an interrupt. Okay. 60. Disable interrupts. Uh, oh, yep. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, self. 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 114. Uh, interrupt disable outstanding. Yep, that one's fine. Um, atomic U size. Uh, number of outstanding request to have interrupts disabled while this number is non-zero interrupts uh, must be disabled uh, when this gets dec decremented back to zero uh, we can re-enable interrupts now uh, 149 boot args yeah, what the fuck do we call it? Lock interrupts? Um. It would actually be really nice if I could implement a lock interrupts on or. Implement the default for a lock cell on, no. Oh. If I could do it for a crate where I could say like, that's the default implementation for this crate. Um, One sixty-five. Okay, we have interrupt depth, and this will be uh, atomic or auto atomic ref new. One interrupts are just uh oh we're not in an interrupt, and then interrupt disable outstanding. This will be atomic u size new one interrupts are currently disabled. Okay. Lock interrupts is private. It's not. Well, it probably is. Yeah, pub struct. Holy shit, that built. Um, wow, I, I thought we had a, a few more errors for a while there. Drop the core locals. Okay. Uh, 34. In core locals. Uh, 34. Method never used. Increment. Okay, RG disable interrupts. This is going to be in the um, kernel at 60. Core locals at 60. Disable enable and then disable interrupts here, enable interrupts here, and then disable interrupts 
Uh, we doing okay. Enable interrupts. Um. Uh, yeah, we want to forcibly enable interrupts in this case. That one makes sense. Um, core locals. We use it on those three spots. Yep. Main.rs. Okay, we don't want to do that. We want to do core enable interrupts. Okay, cargo run. Uh, private associated function. Uh, okay, um, pub. Yep. So disable interrupts, enable interrupts. So this will decrement outstanding, which is one. It'll decrement it to zero. And then here, I'm going to uh, fetch add ID. That one's fine. This one, um, assert self dot zero dot. Oh. Let's count is equal to this. Assert that counts dot fetch sub one. Uh, oops, checked subbed one. Unwrap or expect integer overflow on auto atomic ref increments. That'll check to see if we overflowed because uh, fetch add will do wrapping ads. I'm pretty sure. I should probably know that, but I'm pretty sure it is. I think fetch add will overflow. Wraps on overflow. Yeah. So we need to say that. Uh, check for that. And then this case, we'll do the same thing. Let count is equal to this. Count a checked add one. Integer overflow on decrement. And we're going to do the same stuff down here. Fetch add. Um, let's out, uh, outstanding is equal to this. Assert that outstanding. Integer overflow on disable interrupts increment. Um, and then here we'll say same sort of thing. Here we're going to, there we fetch add, and then here we're going to do a fetch sub, and here we'll do a checked add on decrement. Okay, and then. If OS is equal to one, enable interrupts. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, reference count got decremented to zero. Uh, re enable interrupts. Assert. Oh, we can just, uh, we're not asserting that. Whoops. Um, assert, same for this. It's just an expect. This as well. Okay. Much better. 34 increments. Never used. Yeah. Okay. Enter lock, disable interrupts. Exit lock, enable interrupts. Okay. Now... In interrupt, we gotta increment that. That's interrupt depth. And interrupt depth is auto atomic ref, which we never do anything with. It starts off at zero. If it's greater than zero, then we're in an interrupt. Okay, now that means in our interrupt handler, we'll do this um, core um, interrupt depth dot increment. Uh, increments the level of interrupt depth 
this will automatically get um, this will automatically get decremented decremented on a um, when the scope ends. And interrupt depth. Yep, and we want to make that uh, pub unsafe fn interrupt depth self. This will get us access to interrupt depth. Um, self dot interrupt depth. So this is an unsafe accessor for that, effectively. So we'll clean all of this code up very shortly here. Interrupt depth here, increment. And then that'll get decremented when the interrupt returns. Oh god, we're triple faulting. Fuck. Why? Um, is it that Budarg's cast? I don't think so. Should I learn Rust? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's an incredible language. Uh, Bootler is starting. Okay, what the fuck? How do I do this? Why is that crashing? Uh, halt. Okay, we're getting, we're fine. Uh, let's see if we're CPU halt. Initializing the core locals is killing us. Is this not safe? With Repper C. Oh, uh, wait. CPU halt. Let's see where we're at. Okay. Uh, so we get to there. This is gonna fail, I think. This PMM lock. Oh yeah, because we don't have core yet. Um. Um, we can't do this lock because the lock will, uh, get core locals. That'll return a, because core locals aren't set up yet. Ah, uh, lock. Okay. Here's what I think we do. This is a static boot args. Um, struct dummy lock interrupt. Impl lock cell interrupt state for dummy lock interrupt fn in interrupt bool true uh enter lock do nothing exit lock do nothing 
This will take a dummy lock interrupt. Okay, and then that'll fail. Dummy lock interrupt. Dummy lock interrupt. Interrupt. No S. Okay, 192. Uh, add boot args. One ninety two. Okay, this reference doesn't work. Uh, as const this, as const boot args dummy lock interrupt. Uh, lock interrupt, deref it, turn it into a Rust reference. Lock interrupts. Yeah, we're gonna call it lock interrupt. Uh, we already did a bunch of stuff where we called it lock interrupts. Okay, lock interrupts, dummy lock interrupts. Um, dummy lock interrupts. In interrupt is false. Whoops. 192 D reference of a raw pointer unsafe. Okay, we can make that unsafe. No problem. Um, and this, initializing the th locals, I think is unsafe. We need to make that unsafe. Okay. And we should be booting now. Z. Uh, okay. So. Cardi zero online. Uh, halt. Am I halting anywhere? Uh, kernel panic main interrupts those two spots. Okay. Cargo run. Core zero online. Okay. Enable timer. Uh, and then here I can say print a pick timer enabled. Okay, in this case we're panicking and we can't see it. And the reason we can't see it is the serial stuff. Uh, we need to at least mark the serial stuff to bootstrap it. Otherwise, we have no way of printing because uh, it will panic and then we won't be able to see the panic. So this will be a lock cell new uh, non preempt and serial non preempt. New no preempt. Oops. No preempt. Okay, so we should see a panic here. Yes! Okay. Interrupt overflow on... Okay, I don't know why it's this one. Fuck. <laughs> now I'm mad again. Uh -huh. Overflow on disable interrupts. That was, that was the quickest 180. <laughs> I just... Brrrp, brrrp, in and out. Uh -huh. Integer overflow on disable interrupts increment. On disable interrupts. Wait a minute. Oh, I just have this logic wrong. Um, fetch add. Oops. Core locals. Fetch add. Fetch add. 
We're going to add one. Then we're going to make sure that we can safely subtract one from that. Check sub one. Here we're going to add one, and we should be able to sub one from that, which is true. And this is on the increment, on disable interrupts increment. What? Add one. Oh, uh, checked add, I guess. We actually do it that way because we have the prior result. Okay, did we get this wrong in our MM stuff then? SP kernel source MM. We're starting to have a lot of windows open. Checked add. Fetch add that. Check sub. Yeah, this is checked add. If we cannot add, then the virtual memory wrapped on the 64-bit boundary. Okay. I did have it wrong. I, I thought through that logic incorrectly because I get the previous value, and then I try to add myself, and then we see if that overflows. Okay. Cool. That's a bug fix. Here, and then this checked add, fetch add, checked sub, and then fetch add, these ones, checked add, checked sub, because we have the previous value. I don't, I was thinking I had the value afterwards. Okay, we're able to soft reboot. Wow. Wow. Uh, I think we just fixed it because this will disable interrupts. Interrupts will get disabled. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this is done now. So now, uh, interrupt handler. Uh, let's take a look at APIC. Timer interrupt. We use the serial and we use the, yeah, we use the serial here. We use the serial here. We use the a pick here. Oh, how is that not crashing? In interrupt. That would hit the panic. I'm trying to take a lot. Well, in this case, it's actually not working because this lock should fail. Um, because that APIC lock hasn't been designated. Well, let's see. APIC. Yeah, that's a lock interrupts. Lock interrupts will use this. Uh, print checking in interrupt. This might, this might be a place I cannot put a print. Like, very much so. I might not be able to put a print here. Why can't I print here? Why can't I put a print here? Um, oops. Wouldn't you have just taken the lock for uh, that in the first line? Well, when I hit Z, we are in an interrupt, and let's see if uh, I'll print that. I'll print that in here uh, quickly. I will print. Um, oh, and I don't want this shit. Okay, that stuff's gone. Okay, um, disable. And we know that that's getting disabled on drop. Okay, we did break it. And yeah, that makes sense because, um, doesn't make sense. Hmm, that shouldn't. 
Yeah, we shouldn't be able to break it here. Okay. I'm going to print that we're in an interrupt here. Uh, we're going to print the interrupt level at a soft reboot. We're in an interrupt, 100%. So we'll go core. And what is it? Interrupt depth or whatever? I think it is. Uh, load. Uh, count. See what our count is. Zero. Whoa. Okay. So this in interrupt count interrupt depth that starts out as a should start out as a zero. It does. We're not in an interrupt. When we are in an interrupt, we will get access to that, to reference, and then we'll increment it. Let's give an auto atomic ref. Oh, um, no, that's what we want. Oh, I don't bind that, do I? Yeah, that's the problem in interrupts. I don't bind it to a variable. Here, let i depth is equal to this. There we go. Tempted to take a non preemptible lock uh, in an interrupt. Fantastic. Um, and that's going to be the a pick. Um, so the APIC lock, uh, no preempt. And interrupts will need that as well. Yep, we're also taking on, on interrupts. Uh, no preempt, uh, not free list. No preempt. A, Z, okay, it dies on Z, but when we do this, when we reset, it's fine. We're taking interrupts, and then when we Z it, we got a problem. Um, and that happens, so it's actually everything succeeding, and then here where we hit Z, we have a soft reboot requested, and then... The APIC EOI should be fine. Now what I need to do is in a soft reboot, we just need to make sure that's good. That takes the APIC lock. It takes the boot args, uh, the soft reboot address lock and the tram trampoline page table lock. Okay. Nice. It's fucking working. You're taking the APIC lock twice. Where at? Here? No. We release it by the time we call this. Um, oh, and let's mark this this. And that'll definitely make sure that anything will get dropped. Uh, soft reboot in this case. Um, this will be a pointer to a this. Okay. Um, so that doesn't return. That makes sure, it, since this takes no args, everything will get dropped by the time we call it. And Z, we just have an issue, the soft reboot address and the trampoline page table lock um, need to be set up correctly. But what I want to do is I actually want to do the, um, I want to use the get caller or whatever it was. Uh... What is it like? Um, the location. 
I want the lock assertion to be cleaner. Caller. Yep, track caller. Yeah, we'll do that. Uh, return to the location at that. And I think I can just use track caller then on lock cell. Here, track caller. See if this works. Ah, uh, that one never fails. Okay. All right, let's see if this uh, gives a better message. Yes! Source main 41! Fuck yeah! This will tell me now exactly which one I need to fix. Oh, hell yeah, that is nice. Quality of life right there. Source main 41, 23. Specifically, 41, 23. I guess right here. Oh, hell yeah. Dude, that's so nice, that track caller. Oh my god. Dude, that's so much cleaner! Oh, man! Attempted to take a non-preemptible lock in an interrupt, and then it'll show here, and it's like, okay, could I be in an interrupt in this state? And this is, an assert this is not a race condition or anything. This will always unconditionally fail if we're in an interrupt and we haven't marked that uh, as such. So we're going to have... Uh, no preempt, and the soft reboot, no preempt. So while that lock is held, disable interrupts. You set. Z, 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 Z. Oh, fuck, yeah. Oh, yeah. So this proves, this proves that there is no possible path through my interrupt handlers right now. Um, where I acquire a lock that hasn't been in set no preempt, which then means that there is no lock in my system that could deadlock because it's impossible for me to take the lock twice on the same core. Well, I guess I could actually just literally bind it to a lock and like grab the lock twice. So maybe I should add checks for that. Um, let's actually see here. Serial, serial. Yeah, I think I'm going to grab this. We're going to do a core ID. Check this one out. You saw, uh, this will take a, um, uh, what do we, what do we use for a core ID? You size, uh, get the current, uh, active core ID. Um, and if it's none, we just can't use this functionality. Uh, get the current, get the, get the core ID for the running, uh, core. Um, how do I implement this on the bootloader side of things? I could actually get a core ID in the bootloader. I don't need to get the core ID in the on the kernel side. Let's take a look. And I can pass that in. So that's what we'll do is we'll make it so the uh actually I don't have that. Shit. I don't want a CPU ID because that's really slow. Um, yeah, but I kind of want this functionality. I think I might have it return none. In the bootloader. Um, 
if it returns none, then we won't be able to store, we won't be able to do the deadlock detection. Um, uh, for the bootloader, actually we can, uh, for the bootloader, Yeah, okay. Here's what we're going to do. For the bootloader, the core ID will actually be the... Um, maybe it'll be the APIC ID. Can I do that? I could also always return zero, zero or, like, n not zero. Um, and then if I acquire the lock while I'm spinning... Fetch add, acquire the lock, and then when the lock is held, I'll store the core identifier. Uh, what I want to do is, like, um, yeah, I think we'll do this. Um, if the implementer does not have a unique core ID uh, returning none is valid but this will disable the um deadlock detection okay so a uh, holder core id option u size uh holds the oh we can't we don't have mutable reference to the lock cell uh, we can unsafe sell this. Uh, holds the uh, core ID for the core that currently has the lock. Okay. And then I can do uh, hold self dot. And I will do an atomic use size here. I'll hold a core ID. Yeah. And then we can internally handle it. And we'll just fill it in with some trash. Oh, we can't do atomic U size. We have to do atomic U64 here. So this will give a U64. Um, honestly, atomic uh, U32 is sufficient. Holder core ID. Okay, then here we'll do self dot holder core ID dot store I core ID uh, unwrap or not zero. Um, store that we own this. Uh, Store the core ID of the, um, oh, we just don't fit there. Uh, store the core ID of the owner of the lock. So at this point, we have the lock. We can store that identifier. Holder core ID here. We'll say holder core ID is an atomic U32, new Z uh, not zero. And that's kind of like no one currently is holding it, 31. Uh, ooh, that's in bootloader. Okay. Uh, core ID. This returns an option U32. We'll just return a none. Okay. Now we're on the kernel. On core locals. 58. And here we need a uh, core ID. Option U32. This will return a sum core ID as U32. Okay, 170. 
core ID option U32, uh, none. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, let's try this. In the kernel, we're going to make a lock. Let me test is equal to let test is equal to a lock cell new five. Let foo is equal to test.lock. Let bar is equal to test.lock. Currently, this should deadlock. Uh, lock cell. Um, 5u32. Okay. Really? Oh, it doesn't know the I type. Ah, oh, fuck. Yeah. Uh, U32, and then core locals lock interrupts. It's, it's gross. We might just make a macro to create a lock cell. All right. Foo bar lock lock. Okay, so this should deadlock. Yep, we're deadlocked. Perfect. And let's add that detection now. Um, in lock cell, assert that the self, uh, that our uh, core ID is equal to I core ID unwrap or zero. Uh, get the core ID for this core. And in this case, we'll assert core ID is not equal to self dot holder core ID dot load ordering sequentially consistent uh, deadlock detected. Okay. Um, and then this, we can do a core ID here. Uh, store the core ID of the owner of this lock. Done. All right, so this should now panic. Fuck yeah, deadlock detected at 101. If we look at 101, it's the second axis of the lock. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. So deadlocks will either be detected if they're done like literally like this, or um, they'll be prevented in the interrupts. Uh, when a lock is used in an interrupt, it'll disable interrupts when that lock is taken. We can't prevent about this case where you literally are just dumb and you take the lock twice, but we warn you when that happens, which is beautiful. And you don't actually pay the cost of that unless you actually fail to uh, take the lock if you're spinning. So yeah, isn't that nice? Deadlock detected. Fuck yeah. Okay. Here we can enable interrupts. And now this, um, is the interrupt ref count wrong? I increment, oh, I think interrupts just get like permanently disabled. At least they should be. Thanks for all the follows. Holy shit, so many follows. How are y'all doing? I don't know who sent y'all, <laughs> but thanks for all the follows. Okay. RMX Rob or RWX Rob? Oh shit! Oh hell yeah! Okay, so we've got deadlocks uh, or. Uh, so I'm actually really confused here. So we enable interrupts. Um, if I were to enable interrupts in interrupts, interrupts get disabled by the, the, by the interrupt frame. So I think we're actually, 
Our interrupts disablement level is probably fucked. Uh, let's do a uh, print this core interrupts. Uh, this is in core locals interrupts. Uh, we got to take a look at this. And then we got to comment all this code. We did, we did a lot of stuff today. Uh, and before we ship this off, we're going to fully comment and read through all of our diffs, make sure everything's good. Um, we've got a lot of things that we changed here. But I actually really like this design. Exercise the core locals. Um, I think I need to make that unsafe. Uh, problem is, I don't know how I can check if core locals haven't been established. I actually don't have a good way of doing that. Okay, what do we change here? Okay, uh, yeah, so here are my concerns. Is interrupts inherently disable interrupts? And thus, if I were to call disable interrupts, in an interrupt frame, I guess if I were to call enable interrupts, they would get enabled. Uh, I guess it's not a requester for it. Um, so, so here's the thing: we we track like how many times interrupts have been disabled. So, at this stage, uh, requested disabled is zero. Whoops, disabled is zero. An interrupt happens. This causes uh, interrupts to get disabled. IF, the interrupt flag, gets cleared. Requested disabled is still zero. If I were to enable interrupts inside, if I were to enable the interrupts inside of an interrupt, I think I would get an integer overflow, and I will hit that on an exception case. Uh, core pointer right, volatile, uh, zero as mute u32. We're just going to cause a crash. Um, fatal exception, waiting for soft reboot. OK. Oh, that, that forcibly enables interrupts. Um, yeah. Yeah, this is actually correct. Uh, enable interrupts. If we did core, enable interrupts right here, this would actually panic due to an integer overflow, underflow. Yes! OK, perfect. That works exactly as I expect. Uh, forcibly, we're going to enable interrupts. And then, OK, sweet. OK, fatal exception, waiting for soft reboot. Shift Z, and we get the okay. So we're able to get out of that. Okay, let's bring up the other cores. Let's panic all of the cores. Let's enable timers on all the cores. Um, here we'll do this. We'll get access to the APIC. Oh yeah, yeah, buddy. Uh, this, 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 this. Enable timers on all the cores. So all of the cores will have interrupts enabled. And first, I want to see if that works. We've never enabled the timer on all of them, but this should work. Nice. All cores online, and they're getting APIC interrupts. Exactly what I want to see. OK. And we're able to soft reboot that. Oh, OK. We can still deadlock this. How is this happening? Um, oh, it got paused. Oh, whoa. Uh-oh. Um, uh, is that infinite recursion on a panic? Yes. Can this happen single-threaded? I think it can. Um... 
Wait, no. How is this happening? Reset. Panic and bootloader. Oh boy. Oh boy. Uh oh. We got probs. Uh. What is going on with this VM? Okay. Z. Panic and bootloader. Uh, do, do, do. What the heck, you started working at 18? Yep, I did. Uh, sorry for being nosy. Uh, could you tell me if you actually went from major in IT? I did not. I have no education. Z. Fuck. What is going on here? Um, let's do this. Let's see if this is a problem single core. And I don't think it is. So what would change multiple cores? Are we not waiting for those inits to go through? I think single core, this is fine. Multi-core. Is there something stupid I'm doing? Yeah, no education. I mean, I did high school. Well, through high school. <laughs> um, let's see. Literally a dropout, yeah. <laughs> Uh, is he employed? Am I employed? Yeah, I'm employed. Work on Microsoft. Okay, so this seems to work. Why is this fucking up with multiple cores? Um, let's see. Let's try this. Panic and bootloader. Oh! <gasps> I theorized this, I theorized this in my head like four hours ago. Um, we're not disabling the APIC timers if we enable them on those cores. So if I do, uh, if core is BSP, oops. Uh, wow, I'm struggling to do Vim today. Okay, uh, is BSP, if it's the BSP, and we do this, we should not have an issue at all. This should work indefinitely. Well, panic and bootloader, because something gets really corrupt. Uh, we actually have to force off. I think we have to reboot everything when this happens. Okay, uh, reset. Okay, that actually... Wait, what's going on now? Okay, maybe my theory is not right. Panic and bootloader, enable interrupts. Uh, I don't know how I'd be panicking on the bootloader side of things. Like what's, what's happening here? Multiple cores, if we don't have multiple cores, we have no problems. I thought this was an issue because I brought up the Apex. Refine single core. Okay, multi core. We're not tearing down the other cores correctly. Oh, panic and bootloader. Um, is it due to that? In interrupt is always false in the bootloader. Core ID is... 
That's finding... Ah. I am a doofus. Um... Have you bought the server? I haven't. I have not. Uh, okay, so the issue is the the deadlock detection is actually detecting a, a false positive. Um, what I need to do is when I take a lock, I need to set the core ID. And then in this case, yeah, we need to disable those checks uh, in lock cell. So in lock cell, we're going to say if core ID is not equal to this, um, uh, only do deadlock detection on uh, valid core IDs. If we don't have a core ID, in, in the case of the bootloader, we don't have a core ID subsystem. Um, we should actually plumb that through. Maybe uh, we don't have thread locals in the bootloader, so we don't have a way of giving the core ID. Um, well, the bootloader only has one core running at a time. Uh, we could actually make this work with a global in the bootloader. Uh, okay, but here's the real problem: is I don't set uh, set that there is no current owner of the lock. Uh, is that an issue? No. I think that fixes it right there. Does it? Okay. I mean, I, I, like, I suspected it would, but I'm confused as to why. The bootloader is always going to use the same core identifier, but the bootloader never has contention on a lock. Yeah, the bootloader, the the bootloader. Yeah, the bootloader never is supposed to have contention on a lock. Um. I acquire a lock. All the locks are re released in the bootloader by the time I go to the kernel. I mean, clearly that fixed it. If the quality is not zero, unwrap or not zero. If this is, I see, this is not happening in the bootloader. This is happening. This is happening in core locals at this stage. At this stage when we don't have a core identifier. Yes, sir, Bob. Let's get a core ID. Uh, let's do this. Let's put this back in here. And this should fail again, which is good. That's what I want. Great. Now, panic and bootloader. That's happening due to contention between the bootloader and the kernel, which is also using a not zero because it's returning none. What I need to do is I need to get a core ID here. Let core ID is this is equal to the cores online. So uh, get a unique core ID. Then here, this will have just the core ID, which is that. Um, actually, we can't store anything in there, can we? At this dummy state, when we don't have a core ID. Dummy lock interrupts, U64. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I can't store any value in there.
I can do a. I can do a const generic. Ah, uh, the core is not a const. Never mind. I can't. Okay. Uh, I have to return none there. Okay. Yep. Okay. So then we have to have this. Um. Uh, this is only do deadlock detection on valid core IDs. And this will work. This will do deadlock detection, but not in that very early stage. Oh, deadlock detected. Ah. Nice. Let's uh let's reboot this and hold this Z. Oh. Uh-oh. Fuck. That happens if a core is coming up and has the lock when we init the core. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, okay. All right. Okay. This needs to go. This init everyone has to go. What we're going to do is we're going to make sure all cores check in. We're going to register an interrupt handler for an IPI. And then this is going to be like the... Hey, I need you all to die uh, uh, when you can. We can do this with a global if they have their timer set up. So basically, I was unknitting the course, but I could unknit another core that had a lock held. And then that would call me to cause me to die. Um soft reboot adder. Yes. It's on these locks. If I actually if I kill all the other cores at this phase, I think this fixes that issue. Uh, reset. Oh, nope, still broken. Um, can we send in a knit and then use Yes, if one is currently using the bootloader stack, that's that's the issue. If one's using the bootloader stack, okay. So we're gonna fix all of this anyways. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna signal to the other threads. Um, request that the other threads tear themselves down. Um. Um, the problem is I don't know what, how many cores are coming up. We might need to write ACPI table parsers to do this correctly so that we can identify how many cores are supposed to come up and then we wait for them to all to come up before we allow soft reboots. And when a soft reboot happens, we would, yeah, because then knitting the other processor... So we can we can fix this temporarily. Uh, this is init all other cores, and we'll do this after we grab the locks. So once we have done, once we have obtained all the locks that we'll ever use again, then init all other cores, and then we might need to. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, Init all other cores. So this is going to deadlock. We can actually temporarily fix this. Okay, perfect. Deadlock. And that's deadlocking. That's actually deadlocking in the uh, stage zero, which is the uh, early boot part. 
that's deadlocking due to um, due to the stack available being zero. S uh, set up that we're in a fresh boot, and uh, set up that the stack is available for use. Stack avail. The other cores will be in it. They'll be fully reset. Uh, boots, that's fine. Boots, we actually persist. So let's see, uh, colon space D. It's just these three. Okay, so those have been reset. This fixes the bug. Uh, cargo run clean, cargo run. This fixes that bug, I'm pretty sure. Uh-oh. 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 Z, Z, Z. Okay. Nope, still gets fucked. Unless those init's are not complete. We'll do this. Four and zero dot dot. 100,000. It's massive overkill. But I want to see if maybe we're... Maybe we're assuming the other cores have stopped execution prior to when they have. Um... No, nope, that deadlocked. I don't know how. Drop in place. Drop in place will potentially grab another lock. Apex shouldn't be valid at this point. But it is. Whoa. Oh, because that drop in place is creating a new thing. This is gonna this is just gonna like triple fault. Hmm. Fuck. Uh, I have a degree in computer science, have worked at three dev companies, none of them asked for a proof of degree. I mean, degrees are valuable in a couple different ways. They're valuable for, first of all, giving someone confidence in applying for a job, because a lot of people will be way too afraid to apply for a job unless they have a degree, especially if the job says bachelor's required. And you might say that's like not a real thing, but it, it totally is. People will not apply to jobs, and they won't have confidence without a degree in a lot of cases. Um, okay, and not all the other cores. Drop that. Trampoline CR3. That we have the table. Um, good morning from California. Morning, Cryptos. How you doing? But, I don't know. A lot of people will struggle to learn unless they're forced to learn, right? A lot of people aren't going to go out and learn on their own, especially things that an employer might necessarily want in an employee. Uh, you might have really spotty knowledge where you learn only the things you want to learn, and then you're not very practical as an engineer. So, <clears throat> that's a pretty common thing. Okay. Fuck. Why is this broken? Multi-core. We're knitting the other cores, which would cause them to potentially have locks held. But all the locks should get reset. Oh, uh, what's this? Reset. Whoa. Oh, maybe that maybe that's just aggro. And then all the other cores. There we go. Let's do one. Reset. Okay. That's working. So 
So single core, we're fine. Multi core, we run into issues. Yeah. And I think it's because we're not waiting for all the cores to be online. And then we're knitting things in a really weird way. Fuck. Okay, so uh, let's let's counterpoint this. Um, cores online. Where's that? Cores online. Uh, pub static that. Um, we're gonna pub that temporarily. We'll de we'll restrict that shortly. Um. <sighs> while cores online load ordering sequentially consistent is not equal to four do nothing so this will wait for all the cores to be up uh core locals this will wait for all the cores to be online ah this will be uh core atomic i think atomic so while we don't have four cores online, while we don't have four cores online, spin here. Okay. Um, ooh. Okay, let's see if this dies. It does. Whoa. Deadlock detected MM two sixty four. What's MM two sixty four? Two sixty four. Um, performing a dynamic allocation when we already have uh, yeah, I think we really need to add ACPI support to bring up these cores one at a time. If we're not bringing up cores one at a time, we're gonna have issues. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. This reset and then it freezes and that's a enable interrupts. Yeah, I think while I have init's APIC lock, boot RX, these locks are fine. And then all of the cores. Wait. Enable the timer. <gasps> Am I getting timer interrupts? Oh yeah, there's another thing I have to add. In the um, in the APIC here, we're only gonna do soft reboot if core is uh is BSP. We only ever want to do a soft reboot from the um 
only ever want to do a soft reboot from the BSP. But that shouldn't be the issue. Deadlock detected. MM264. That means we took a lock on the same core. And it wasn't due to an interrupt. Which is really bizarre. Or core IDs are getting fucked up. Um... I've been going for 16 hours. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, oh, here we're not ending the other cores at all. Okay. This is what we want to do. We want to enable timer interrupts on all cores. Is that unsafe? No, I don't think so. Wait for all cores to come online. When all cores are online, then... Once all cores are on... Okay, deadlock detected. Now we have interrupts firing on all the cores. Uh, Shift Z is currently not working. And let's print is BSP on these. Let's do this. Uh, core is BSP. If is BSP is getting broken, that's a pretty catastrophic problem. Okay, that looks good. Okay. So we should have interrupts firing on all these cores. That'll cause us to go into um, the timer interrupt should be running on all cores. So you should be able to say print timer on this core ID. I don't know how frequently that's printing. This might be really spewy. Okay, we're not hitting that at all. Um, okay, that's kind of a good sign. Cores online. Enable interrupts. And we never got a timer interrupt. Oh, we got to go this way, don't we? No. Right, ICR. Bring all the cores up. Initialize the APIC. Enable the timer. Enable the timer. Uh, is it because I'm moving where that APIC is, maybe, for the other cores? I don't think so. What can we fix here? Shit. Mm. Okay. So those APIC interrupts are not working multi-core. Uh, if I go single core, it should work. I should be able to get timer interrupts. We got to comment this shit out. Okay, where are my timer interrupts now? 
Oh, I have the Apic lock. Ah. Uh. And that disables interrupts. I see. Okay, timer on zero. Yep. So I guess if we end up leaking a lock, we can prevent ourselves. Timer on zero. So that's resetting. We're only seeing timers on zero. Okay. Why am I not getting timers on the others, on the other cores? Yeah, so I can potentially just permanently disable interrupts if I have a lock held. And then that looks very much like a deadlock. So I actually don't know how useful this is then. If I have it automatically disabling those. Well, I need to disable the interrupts, but I can't detect if I just permanently am holding interrupts disabled. And when you get to a function that doesn't return, I don't think locks get freed. Yeah, let's uh, let's do this. And I yeah, we don't get timer interrupts. Okay, if I do return CPU halt, do I get timer interrupts? No. I'm surprised this doesn't go out of scope when I, I guess this function doesn't return and I'm calling it. How do I? So calling halt can basically cause me to permanently have locks open. So anywhere that I call halt is relatively dangerous because I might end up keeping locks open forever. I actually thought that the non-returning, it would treat that as the end of the scope. But it doesn't. Oh, less SO is LIDT. Oh yeah, we got that all figured out. Now we're working on, we're trying to make our lock subsystem resistant to deadlocks and uh, like kind of hard to fix bugs. So we're trying to, we're trying to make it so it's much more detectable when like a lock is held in a weird way. In this case, we're getting timers on zero only. Okay, if core ID is one. Oh, nice. Apic lock, bring up the other cores. So the other cores apics are not behaving normally. Okay, that's interesting. Why would the other cores behave differently? Uh, they must not be disabling, enabling interrupts on the other cores. Let's try this. Nope, that's, that's hitting the overflow case. Enable interrupts. Uh, let's do, um, unsafe CPU. Enable interrupts. Let's forcibly enable interrupts. And let's see if we ever get one through here. Nope. Apic. Let's EOI this. Unsafe. Are these cores being booted up with 
like broken apex I'm not quite sure And this is enable timer Periodic mode lock interrupts add a handler and print enabled interrupts uh en enabled timer see if we're hitting that enabled timer weird I'm gonna not register a timer or not. We're gonna see what happens here. Huh. And I'm enabling interrupts. For some reason, the Apex broken on these cores. All right. I think I'm gonna call it there for now. We'll work on fixing a bunch of these bugs. I'll probably fix a lot of these off stream, but. I'm going to wrap it up for now. That's been a long, good stream. I've had a lot of fun. We implemented a lot of cool things. Uh, now I just want to button them up. I got a lot of stuff here that's kind of all over the place that I probably need to rewrite and rethink. Um, so thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Hope you all had fun. Is the kern the compiled Rust binary? Yeah, that's an executable, a PE, a, a PE file. Hell yeah, no problem. Easy streaming, bunch of fun. All right. See y'all around. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you had a blast. Thanks for all the follows, all the subs. See you around.